Good morning and welcome everyone. <clears throat> this is the 20th day of the hearing of submissions on Plan Change 7. And this morning we have the submission of Horticulture New Zealand to be heard. Ms Atkins, good morning. Good morning, sir. So, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I'm just sorry. checking there was nothing else that needed to be covered. Are you just happy for me to start, um, sir? Whenever it suits you. Thank and, you. Uh, just as is comfortable for you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to uh, introduce the team, um, which is up on the screen for those of you who are here, and hopefully you have it in front of you. Um, so we have a number of growers who will be presenting to you um, mostly this morning. One, one can't come till this afternoon. So you're going to be hearing from the first um, five growers this morning, and they're all here. Um, David and Sue Payne of Peelview Orchard can't be here till uh, just after lunch, so we're going to slot them in um, at, at, a, at an appropriate time then. Um, then on the other side of the slide is the sort of technical legal team, um, which is obviously myself and my colleague Louise um, Ford, who's sitting uh, by the window um, on my left. Uh, next to me is Rachel McClung, who is in-house at Horticulture New Zealand, and you have a statement of evidence from Rachel. Um, and then after Rachel presents, we'll slot in the five growers, um, and that's the order of, of the slides that are in front of you. Um, and then we'll come back to the technical team, um, starting with uh, Tom Nation, uh, Susan Goodfellow, Damien Farrelly, Andrew Barber, Stuart Ford, and Vance Hodgson, and as I said, depending on when David and Sue uh, come in the proceedings, we'll, we'll slot them in uh, into an appropriate place um, later on in the day. So um, Rachel will be taking you through the, the sort of summary of Horticulture New Zealand's position. I've mentioned the grower presentations, um, the expert presentations, and obviously we're just here to answer any questions you have uh, at any time you, you want to ask them. Um, so just um, before I he talk about some key points, which is really just picking up on the main matters in my legal submissions that have been pre-circulated, um, just wanted to say that uh, yesterday we, we decided to provide you with a copy of some corrections to the evidence. It just seemed, I know we could have done it orally, and we can do that orally as well as the relevant people present, but I just thought it might be helpful to have it in writing. Um, particularly as one of the changes was to a table, and it was just clearer to have that recorded, both for yourselves, um, but also from the point of view of um, the, the website that other parties are using to keep up to date with proceedings. So hopefully that's um, made its way to you. Um, so just in terms of the key points, which are really just a summary of the matters raised in the legal submissions, which I don't propose to, to read, um, obviously, as you have already seen them. Um, so what Horticulture New Zealand is, is seeking is essentially a bespoke approach for commercial vegetable growing. Um, and it's our evidence and my submission that that is consistent with the regulatory framework of the overall plan uh, with, within which Plan Change 7 sits, and also with the RMA. And when I mention the RMA, I am, of course, also including the higher order uh, documents that you must also uh, give effect to, and I'll talk about the MPSFM uh, 2020 shortly. Um, it's my submission that the Horticulture New Zealand proposal is backed up by sound science and other related technical evidence, such as planning and economics, um, to support its proposal. Uh, it's our submission, and we can talk about this more fully, and, and we all have um, had the benefit of being able to see the Potatoes New Zealand presentation to you in particular. Um, it's our submission that our proposal will meet the requirements of other submitters, and we can talk a bit more about that. And I know that, that some questions of them uh, were asked, um, and their proposal has changed a little bit from what was originally in their uh, original submission. Now, I, I also, um, in my submission, legal submissions, you'll see, I've um, listened to and had the opportunity to read uh, the legal submissions, particularly of the Council, but also um, Department of Conservation wrote some reasonably um, uh, sort of comprehensive legal submissions, and I've read both of those. And I agree with the assessment 
um, that with regard to the NPCFM 2020, that if there is scope to do so, so if the submissions give you scope to do so, then it can be considered um, and possibly even given effect to. But I also agree with the Council that uh, Plan Change 7 uh, predates the date that the NPSFM was gazetted. In fact, it, in terms of its genesis, it predates um, the freshwater um, healthy you know, uh, proposals that were announced by the government last year. So the Canterbury Regional Council proposes to undergo a, a comprehensive review of its plan um, with regard to the NPSFM 2020. So we can expect there will be future plan changes um, that will be promulgated uh, with regard to that, um, that policy, um, national policy statement. Um, in my submissions, I've, I've talked about um, the importance of needing to take care when the word avoid is used, and this just um, references our rebuttal evidence. Mr Hodgson produced some rebuttal evidence in support of some evidence that was produced by Ravensdown in relation to the use of that word uh, in one of the policies, and he can talk to you uh, more about that when he presents his evidence. Um, and with regard to prohibited activities, um, again, a very um, bes bespoke section of my legal submissions, I just um, talk about those in my legal submissions because um, obviously what we're seeking is not to have a prohibited activity pathway, but rather look to uh, change that to a non-complying activity pathway. And my legal submission is that um, there is case law support for the fact that you need to take care when using prohibited activities. Um, they should be, in my submission, the exception um, rather than the rule, and really should only be used where there is clear evidence to support their use. Um, in this case, I guess what we're saying is there is still a lot of uncertainty um, in terms of the way in which the framework will, will operate in practice, and a prohibited activity pathway would mean that inadvertently you could end up with some of our uh, growers not even being able to have the benefit of seeking a consent if um, their activity can't meet uh, the pathways otherwise provided. So they were the key uh, matters that I just wanted to highlight from my legal submissions and I'm happy to take any questions on those or, or any other matters that you, you want to ask me about. Well, thank you, Ms. Atkins. Commissioner Van Portuzen, any questions at this stage of Ms. Atkins? Yes, thank you, sir. Just um, two questions. The first one arises from para 28 of the legal submissions. And I'll put this to you because I'm interested in your view, but also um, Mr. Hodgson, when we hear from him, I'd be interested in his view. Mm. But it relates to policy 436, capital A. Do you have a copy of the section 42A, offices, track changes, recommendations? Yes, I do. So on my version, that's on about page 20, I'm not sure. 20, sorry, did you say? Yeah, it might be a bit different on the hard copy. I'll have a look. Uh, so, 4.36 capital A. 4.8. Yes, I've got it in front of me, thank you. And so the issue you raise in your legal subs is in uh, clause B, the word avoiding. Yes. And I see down in C, um, no, down in D, sorry. Yes. It starts with the words constraining as far as practicable. Yes. And a thought I had was, um, would it be, in terms of your um, concerns, if the word avoiding was replaced with those words constraining as far as practicable, given that those words are already in the policy, would that yes. meet your concerns yes, as well? Would. Yes, it would. I haven't had a chance to discuss it with Mr Hodgson, but he can address <laughs> you separately on that point. Um, I mean, we didn't pick this up in our original um, submission or in our evidence in chief, but we obviously noted it in the Ravensdown yeah. planning evidence. Um, and having reflected on it, um, decided that it was important just to put our view forward. I, I just think avoid, as we know, is now to be determined to be quite con quite constraining, completely constraining. So um, th there's absolutely an intention in the policy to provide a limiting framework, but it shouldn't be absolute. So that's... Um, that would, that would certainly meet my requirements, Mr Hodgson. 
I'm not being, it tells me I'm not going to be inconsistent with something he might address you on later. So thank you. Thank you. And just a question. I note that the um, the RMA in clause, par, or clause 217B now defines horticultural land use. Yes. Does that have any implication for the definitions that you have recommended to us in, in the Hort New Zealand submission? We, no, we don't think so, because the, the definitions that we're looking at here are more specific uh, in relation to the activities that we are asking the plan to include, including the changes we're seeking to those definitions. Yep. So it's sort of a subset of the, the higher order um, yep. that's in the RMA. Okay. And then not really a question, but just in terms of this issue that's raised in, in your submission, um, the threshold for the permitted activity, 0.5 hectares versus 5 hectares. Yes. I just noted with interest that the NESFM regulation 8 bracket 1 bracket B uses 5 hectares as a threshold. It does, and from memory, I think in Mr Hodgson's evidence, he talks about that. If not, we have discussed it, and I guess that the point is that it would be consistent, yes. therefore, with the NES. That was just a thought I had too, but no further questions, thank you. Thank you. Any questions at this stage, Ms Saltman? No, no <laughs> questions for me, thank you. Ms Atkins, I didn't want to ask anything about your legal submissions, which I found clear and easy to follow, thank you. But I did want to ask a question about something in the original submission. Yes, certainly. And this, I think, comes on the page five in the, the, um, in the version of, of, that you get on the screen, but it's probably not that in the version that you have in your hand. So let me see if I can find that. Yes. Section 4, yes. 40 heads overall submission. Can yes. you find that heading? Yes. Now, if you go down from the, the first paragraph, stands on its own, and yes. then becomes a paragraph where Port NZ talks about a list of things that it says are fundamentally flawed. Oh, yes, yes. Strong language. Yes. It is strong language, sir. And I'm, I'm um, going to go to, to come to ask you about what your understanding is of the purpose of this hearing. Yes, certainly. Do you agree that the purpose of the hearing, and perhaps uh, if it matches the purpose, the purpose of Paul Hensley's submission to is to be constructive? Yes. Or is it to be disparaging? No, it's to be constructive, sir. So, would you say that you're being constructive if you call fundamentally flawed to say that it's inconsistent this is item 7 of your list, inconsistent with the recent government essential freshwater policy announcements. Now, at the stage at which this was written, they were policy announcements. They were not in effect. I don't understand how it could be thought that at the time when Plan Change 7 was proposed, and publicly notified that it could have been in any way uh, consistent with those documents which hadn't then been published. And I think that it might even have been said to have been impertinent for Plan Change 7, even if it had been possible mm. to, to conform with those uh, proposals because they were proposals to go through quite an elaborate uh, process of consultation before they were adopted, as we know, only a few months ago. Correct. So, I'm not understanding really how this shows how Court New Zealand wishes to be understood as taking part in these proceedings 
where, as you and I agree, the purpose is being constructive rather than disparaging. So, Sue, I'd just, just to answer you in respect of two things, firstly, the use of the words fundamentally flawed, I agree, is somewhat um, overstating um, the position. I, I think it's fair to say that it's Horticulture New Zealand's position that um, the framework as notified had flaws in it. They're not necessarily fundamental flaws, but certainly flaws that Horticulture New Zealand sought to, is seeking to have addressed and amended um, through the submission process. So hence is wishing to be constructive uh, in that regard. With regard to point seven specifically, I agree with you that there is no way that the council could have, well, there's no way the council could have been expected to, in any legal sense, um, give effect to the freshwater policy announcements that were made around the time that Plan Change 7 was notified, um, in the same way that there's no legal obligation upon you as a decision maker to give effect uh, to the MPS FM 2020 and related documents, except to the extent the submissions give you scope to do so. So what, what I would say, though, in relation to um, point seven, um, is that those announcements, and we've mentioned them throughout the evidence, and now the policies that have landed, are kind of relevant uh, to the conversation in my you know, they, we did under, we did know uh, uh, in general terms um, some of the things that were uh, likely to come through the system back in back at the time that PC7 was uh, notified. But but I totally accept your criticism that it, it's not fair to suggest that the council in any way had to have given effect to them or, or should have uh, given effect to them given. They were just policy announcements, and some of them have changed quite substantially from that date. So apologies for that, sir. It's, um, again, I'd just comment that it, we certainly think the framework is flawed. We're not meaning that in any pejorative sense. Um, just, just the fact that the purpose of the plan change was in part to provide a pathway uh, for commercial vegetable growing activities. And, and the problem is, we, we say, in our evidence and in my submission that um, we haven't quite got there yet, which is why we're we're here before you today. Well, thank you for your response. Let, let us uh, understand that our wish as commissioners is to have a constructive process and that will be easier for us, despite the scale and scope of the, of the proceedings, it will be a lot easier for us if we don't get distracted by disparagements, to put a mild word on it, and if we instead just keep our eye on the ball of being constructive. Absolutely, sir. Now, where would you like to take us next? Right, thank you. So the first, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the evidence. So the first person to address you is Ms McClung, um, who's the Environmental Policy Advisor at Hort NZ. So you have a statement of evidence from her, which was pre-circulated back in July. Um, and what Ms McClung will do is she will highlight um, aspects from her statements, similar to the way I did it in my legal submissions, um, and then obviously be there to answer any questions on anything she presents today um, and any detailed information in her statement of evidence. So I'm just going to hand the microphone up over to her. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, good morning, Council officers. Um, as Ms Atkins said, I'm the Environmental Policy Advisor, South Island with Horticulture New Zealand. And in this role, I represent the interests of growers um, at the regional and district council processes across the South Island, sometimes in the North Island when needed, and also in central government processes when needed also. 
I've been in this role since October 2017, and PC7 was one of the first projects that I was asked to work on. So I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge the efforts of others in getting us to this point in the process. So firstly, um, ECAN. Back in November 2017, I met with Tammy Woods, Principal Consents Advisor with the implementation team, and she worked with me to identify the issues. She prepared a report to Council that recommended the plan change and really got the ball rolling for us. Then early in 2018 through to 2019, we worked with Olivia Cook and Andrea Richardson, senior planners in the policy team. Um, both were very constructive to work with and they established a growers working group with us. This was very helpful in refining the issues and testing potential solutions. ECAN ran the, ran the workshops and we had a number of growers that attended them from across Canterbury and from a range of crop types. So I'd like to also acknowledge those growers who gave up their time. Um, the growers in the working group were David Hadfield, Alan Lim, Peter McCracken, John Evans, Rebecca Turley, Sarah Kikastrahana and her daughter Jessica. And all these growers were put forward by the Canterbury Horticultural Society. So I'd like to thank them for putting them forward. I'd also like to thank Councillor Claire Mackay and the full council for um, hearing our concerns regarding the notification timeframes for PC7 and pushing to extend these. There was certainly a lot, of, a lot of material to digest and we very much appreciated the extension of time. And lastly, from the ECAN perspective, Tavisha Fernando, the hearing secretary. Tavisha has been fantastic in um, liaising with us. She's been very timely, accurate and professional and it's certainly helpful as a submitter. I know that she'll have a lot of people that she's dealing with in this process. Next, I'd like to thank the primary sector representatives that we've been working with. Um, we have great collaboration with these throughout the process. They're a fantastic group to work with and I really appreciate that they've come to me for the, with their queries and we appreciate the support they've shown Hort NZ in this plan change and also they've challenged us when needed. And they are Charlotte Wright from Dairy NZ, Lauren Phillips from Beef and Lamb, Anna Wilkes from Ravensdown, Hannah Ritchie, Pork NZ, Dr Lionel Hume, Federated Farmers, Julia Crossman, Opua Water, Paul Reese and Laura Bunnings from Water Strategies, representing Wymac Irrigation Limited, Kari Bunnett from Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture, Eva Harris from Irrigo, who's also here with us today, representing a number of irrigation schemes. And we're very happy to have such a great team of rural professionals in Canterbury, and we think that the outcomes of the Canterbury Land and Water Plan will reflect this. Next, the Hort NZ product groups. A special thank you to Onions New Zealand, Vegetables New Zealand, Processed Vegetables New Zealand, and Potatoes New Zealand. I'd like to specially mention Potatoes New Zealand for the science they've brought to the, to the process, particularly how they're leading the way with Overseer to improve the accuracy of their crops. Their leadership has stimulated investment by other product groups and has been the basis for the new Sustainable Vegetable Systems project to improve the accuracy of Overseer for other vegetable crops. And if the panel have um, any questions regarding that, then Mr Andrew Barber, who's here with us today, is directly involved in that project and could provide further comment. Oh, and then our growers. Very big thank you to the time they've taken to submit and present to the hearing panel. This assists Hort NZ in explaining the implications of PC7 and to the reporting officers and the hearing panel. I'd like to thank Dave and Des Winter and Sarah and Hahn at Kickestra, who's presented before us today and then also the growers that are present with us today. These presentation, in these presentations, we want you to understand that there, there are some further refinements that can be made to, to provide the outcomes that can work for our growers. This is just a slide of all the product groups that we had. Um, I won't go into that in detail as this has been pre-circulated, but there are 22 product groups across a range of fruits and vegetables. Uh, this slide outlines the key outcomes that Hort NZ seek, um, and again, as I realise this has been pre-circulated and Ms Atkins has gone into some detail, I won't read them verbatim. I'll just reiterate that the presentations you hear today from our growers and experts will reinforce the outcomes that we're seeking. And this is another way at looking at um, what it is we're seeking. We've used a flow diagram both in our um, 
submission, and then here we have included a similar diagram for ease of comparison. Uh, we've highlighted in red where the Hort NZ position has altered from the original submission, and this is through the review of the Section 42A reports and the development of Hort NZ evidence. Um, we've found a, a, a useful diagram in explaining our position to growers and other submitters, and we hope that you find it of assistance also. And then here is the Hort NZ strategy. This provides us guidance on how we set our, um, on how we operate, and it sets our purpose and vision. It was adopted by our board earlier this year, but I believe that our team have been working to the values outlined here through our PC7. How it, regardless, um, particularly when it comes to the how we work, which is the orange bit down the side. Um, and just to pick out a few key ones, um, I believe that we've been proactive in our engagement with ECAN, as dem demonstrated through the Growers Working Group. Um, we've been taking a pan-sector view. We have been evidence-based and we are future-focused in our submissions. Being future focused is particularly important to ensure growth is possible for our, sector, uh, for our sector, to ensure that our growers can fulfil the Hort NZ vision of healthy food for all forever. And while this is our vision, we acknowledge that to produce healthy food, we need a healthy environment, and therefore to fulfil this vision, we must operate within environmental limits. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm happy to take questions on my statement now or at any point. And then I'll hand it over to our next presenter, Mr Ben Scott from Scott Fresh. Um, sorry, Sarah, just, just to add, Ms um, McClung did produce some speaking notes, so if it would be helpful, um, we can provide them to the hearing secretary um, if, if that would assist. Yes, thank you. Please do that. That would be good. Commissioner Van Voort, is there any questions of Ms McClung concerning her evidence or her address just now? No, no questions, but I did find your evidence provided useful context, and I thought the um, flowchart that's on slide number 10 of 89 provides a useful summary of what you now seek, so thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Solomon? No, I have no questions either, but I found Ms McClung's evidence very clear and easy to understand. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. We can go out now to the uh, next speaker. Great, thank you. So we're just going to bring him forward to the microphone next to me. Yeah. Thank you, time. No rush. Thank you. <coughs> so, yep, you just grab some. While he's getting some water, I'll just introduce Ben Scott of Scott Fresh. Um, again, there's some slides in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, he is one of the grower case studies that's attached to Ms McClung's evidence. So obviously he can answer any questions in relation to that case study at the end of his um, short presentation or any other questions you might have of him. So the floor is yours. Right, OK. Um, thanks, Commissioner, Chairman. Uh, to give you a bit of background about Scott Frisch, uh, the business was founded in the 1970s, so we're around 40 or 50 years old. Um, I've been running the operation since 2004. Uh, as an operation, we've moved. Uh, we've moved north from uh, from where we were originally was in Marshlands, uh, and we've moved up to North Canterbury, up to the Conway Flat. Uh, we then moved out to Southbridge, uh, and from there uh, we've closed, sold the Southbridge farm and moved up to Spotswood near Cheviot. Um, so yeah, we've had a, a history of a history of moving. Um, we feel like uh, refugees, I guess, in, in in some respects, but that's uh, that's our situation. Um, as you can see there, our original growing operation was in the Christchurch West Melton zone, which was, uh, which was Marshlands, uh, and then we moved to the Selwyn Waihora zone, um, and from there we've moved predominantly up into North Canterbury, uh, but we've also continued to operate on a, at a much uh, smaller scale uh, down in Greendale, which again is in the Selwyn Waihora zone, but we've gone from sort of 82 hectares in that area down to 16, so it's been quite a, quite a change. I won't go through the the, the, full, the full slide there, uh, but I guess in summary, uh, uh, in the in the wire uh, Kaikoura zone, uh, we've gone from uh, from 45 hectares uh, up to 137 hectares. So the operation has is, is, is expanded considerably in that area, um, and in the Selwyn Waihora zone, uh, we've reduced our operations considerably. 
um, and I'll go into more detail as to why we've done that and, um, and the implications of that in, in later slides. As a company, um, you know, we, we, we've always uh, promoted excellence. Um, I think uh, our successful last year of the promotion of Craig Botting to become the 2019 Young uh, Vegetable Grower of the Year would be a testament to that. Um, the business from 2004 when I took it over to 2016 uh, in those 12 years, the, the business expanded by what was it, tenfold growth. Um, we've, we've taken two farms now and successfully developed them, that being the Southbridge farm, uh, which we took on in 2009, sold in 2017, and then in 2017, when we closed that farm, uh, we set up the Spotswood operation um, from, from then till now, which I think has been a, a, a significant achievement. Um, the Conway Flat operation in North Canterbury, which is on the coast between uh, Cheviot and Kaikoura, uh, that's gone from two hectares of production in 2006. And currently we're producing over 55 hectares of, of crop in that, in that area. Uh, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on is, is the way that we manage our nitrogen. Uh, we've developed a, a tool or a way of uh, direct drilling nitrate in uh, into the base of plants uh, to coincide with rainfall and active growth as opposed to a sort of broad, broad brush approach. And that's taken some time to, to develop, and I believe it's a, a very, very uh, a very positive tool. We, as, as growers, have always um, take, taken a lot of pride in the soil, just on the, on the previous slide there, Rachel, I guess. Um, it, it's very hard to measure um, how a grower looks after their soil, um, but I guess one way is to look at the CEC, or the cation exchange capacity. Um, and it's very hard to increase the CEC of a soil. Um, and I guess the fact that we managed to achieve that um, from the time we took the Southbridge farm on to the time we sold it is something that, as Scott Frisch, we're very proud of. Yeah, the, the business um, up until 2016 uh, was on a, on a there, was, there was a lot of growth and there was a lot of excitement in, uh, in what we were doing. Um, however, you know, our business relies on rot rotation. Uh, without rotation of the crop, uh, we don't have a business. Um, and I think there's a perception that uh, without rotation you might end up with a little bit more disease, you might get spots on your leaves, uh, you might get slightly lower yield. Um, however, the, the reason I put that photo on there is to show uh, without rotation, uh, that's what you end up with. And that disease there is called sclerotinia, and that results in total crop loss. So it's not a case of a slightly less presentable crop, it's a case of no crop. Uh, and that's the challenge that we're facing. Um, and as I say, our business hasn't grown since 2016. In many respects, it's gone backwards. Um, we as a business have gone from a position of strength. Uh, we are one of the only growers in Canterbury that can produce green vegetables for 12 months of the year, which is something that we've always been very proud of and something that we hope to be able to continue to do. Um, but with... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we've gone from a, a, a farming operation uh, in an area that was, um, forgive me, I don't understand the, the terminology, but uh, f fully uh, allocated to an area that's uh, very low, uh, surrounded by very low intensity farms, uh, sheep and beef farms, and that for us um, has been uh, has been the biggest issue, and it's given us uh, the, the lack of ability to expand our expand our operation. Uh, Oh, okay, yep. So, oh, and again, just going back to the Young Vegetable Grower of the Year, um, the person that was featured in the slide previously, um, he's now moved on. And I think people like that often do move on because as a business we're not able to grow and provide them the opportunities which we would had we had the opportunity to go on to, uh, and to you know, do bigger and better things. Uh, we've also significantly, you know, on that had to walk away from purchasing land uh, that we would have liked to have had the opportunity to buy, and we've done that because there really isn't a pathway for us as an operation to go onto that land because, again, the history on that land is of, of a low-intensity in, low sheep and beef operation. So where we were in marshlands, uh, we operated there, Dad operated there in the 1970s through to 2007. Uh, it's an at-risk zone. Uh, there's no more fertiliser used on there since 2007. It's all in... Uh, uh, it's a non-grazed pasture. It's all just cut and carry pasture now. Um, after 2011, uh, actually our block was not rezoned residential, but a lot of the areas there were. Um, unfortunately, because we were operating uh, prior to 2009, and of course because we we're operating now in an area outside of that same zone, uh, we can't transfer our right to um, 
you know, our, our nitrogen losses to, to a farming operation in an area that's, uh, that's less intense, such as North Canterbury. Uh, so we then closed up there. Uh, we went to um, we, we bought a bought a farm in Southbridge, which I talked about before. Um, we operated there between 2009 and 2017. Uh, as an area, it's it's fully allocated both in terms of water um, and also water quality outcomes not uh, not being met. Um, and it is now a grazing um, farm and, and with with grain as well. Um, and we have yeah, we've sold and moved on from there. In doing that, we moved to Spotswood in North Canterbury, up near Cheviot, um, where we operated uh, from 2017 to the present. Um, I guess in doing that, we, we feel like we've gone to a non-fully allocated zone, um, uh, and, it's, and it's not a red water quality outcomes, uh, or not met zone. Um, uh, th this particular farm, the reason we're able to move on to it was because the years 2009, two th in 2013, it had a history of dairy grazing and nitrogen leaching. Um, so that is the reason that we're able to buy and operate on that farm. Uh, now, we haven't transferred our losses from our Southbridge operation to this farm, and this farm is only suitable as a summer operation. Uh, we can't use it as a winter operation because of the climate. So the Conway Flat operation, uh, that is in the Hiranui Wire and Kaikoura zone. So we operate, yeah, again, over two, two zones uh, for that farming operation. We've operated there since 2006. Uh, the business has significantly expanded between 2006 and 2016. Uh, we went from two to 55 hectares, um, as been the previous slide. It's not a fully allocated zone, um, and it's not uh, and, and not read water quality outcomes, not mid zone. Uh, it's predominantly leased land, um, and it's used for winter production only. Uh, but the biggest challenge for us, as I've pointed out before, is that we are surrounded by uh, lower intensity sheep and beef operations. Um, if we lose lease ground, all of our leases are on one year, a one-year basis, we've got no opportunity to go into other areas, which is a massive threat to our business. Um, unfortunately, there's no opportunity to take our history here and move it to another coastal um, area outside of the zone. Uh, opportunities have arisen, and we haven't been able to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, and again, there's no opportunity to take our leaching history from the fully allocated uh, Selwyn Waihaua zone, as in Southbridge, and, and, and transfer them um, to, to this area. What we're after as growers is acknowledgement that we've been adaptable to the signals from ECAN about the risk of um, over-allocated areas in Canterbury, but in doing it been undermined by historic baseline reference. Um, the commercial vegetable production consenting pathway uh, to enable us to obtain a consent that provides rotation, uh, for the, the rotation on growing land um, and importantly for us, um, baseline data has moved to ensure our expanded activity can be uh, consented. Uh, otherwise, locations where we, to, other, to locations where we do not meet the baseline GMP in loss rate for our current operation will be a prohibitive activity. Um, an acknowledgement that growers uh, operate across water zones in nutrient management areas and a clear pathway to consent this to enable certainty uh, for our operation in the future. Uh, and also the ability to expand in the future to meet, uh, meet demand. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Oh, you can say oh, there might be yeah. some questions. Oh, OK, yes. Not off the hook just yet. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Sorry, the, um, that's the end of Mr um, Scott's presentation, so if there are any questions of him, um, he can uh, he can attempt to answer those. No, no questions, but thanks for the practical examples of the issues that you're facing. Appreciate that. I'm going to let you off the hook too, because I've got no <laughs> questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr Scott, for explaining your, your own personal experiences and how they relate to the ability to support. Submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Th thank you, sir. Um, the next of our grower group to present to you is um, Ross Hewson, who's going to come forward now. Um, it, he's the, his um, presentation should be the next in the slide package in front of you.
Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, we've been we've been farming um, in Canterbury for um, close to 100 years. We've been at our location in Mid Canterbury for the last 20. Uh, we moved there to uh, increase our vegetable and intensive cropping operation and um, <coughs> um, grow potatoes, processed potatoes and vegetables for uh, both McCain and onions for export. Um, we've tackled, some 10 years ago, we tackled our nitrogen loss um, to understand what we were doing. Um, we were concerned that Overseer was throwing up some numbers uh, that we... Um, oh, it's just... Sorry, do I just... You don't, yeah, would be, yeah. Could okay. you just run us through the slides? Yeah, okay. Sorry, we can, oh, that, sorry, we're just making sure what's in front of you is what's in front of Mr. Hewson. So you can, you can, you can pop forward if you wish, but can you just run through the slides? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay? Yeah, no, I'll just go to the slide. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so we farm, uh, we have far, farm at various locations in mid Canterbury, and they're highlighted in the red there. Um, the diversity of sites just assists us with um, hail. Uh, we're in the same water catchment, but um, those locations do help us um, uh, avoid some of the weather events, which are pretty devastating for us. Um, so water, we, we monitor our water use um, pretty intensively um, between weather events uh, and crop requirements. Um, we've found excessive water and fertiliser use is very detrimental to the crops that we grow, uh, particularly um, the, the shelf life uh, and, and also our customer requirements, um, they, can, um, they, they can end up, uh, we can end up in a position where we lose our entire crop uh, through the use, overuse of water uh, and, um, and nutrition. Uh, we've, got, we've had significant gains in production um, over the last 30 years, particularly around our inputs uh, and outputs. Um, I guess, I guess we've learned through um, genetic advancements and plant breeding science and technology has assisted um, cr uh, crop husbandry um, and t we've been able to target our nutrient uh, inputs to uh, meet crop demand when it, when it um, requires it. Um, the use of technology such as um, field net with our irrigation has um, also significantly assisted us um, to be more efficient um, and meet climatic and crop demands um, in line with our best management practice um, goals. So Global Gap, um, we, so currently we, we requ we're required to have Global Gap and uh, New Zealand Gap um, certifications for exporting uh, of our crops. Um, we've found Global Gap is a um, the protocols are particularly useful uh, for auditing our best managed practices. They ensure that we, uh, I guess, are kept on our toes and um, continually evaluating uh, what we do and how we do it uh, to meet their expectations. They're not easy to meet and um, um, we find best management practices probably the best um, guideline uh, for us to, um, to meet those requirements. Um, but <coughs> the standards they subtly set are also key parameters uh, for environmental sustainability uh, and the measurement of the nutrients and, and um, our inputs, um, generally on evidence-based as opposed to, um, uh, sorry, it's evidence-based uh, with uh, support from industry, science and, and uh, experience. Overseer has been a, um, we're under the BCI scheme in Mid Canterbury. Overseer has been a key component uh, and requirement of that. Um, we've been uh, completing Overseer for six years now. We've become very frustrated uh, at times with that. It's an assumption model. And uh, the experience we had probably 15, 16 years ago with crop and food, along with McCain's an evaluation of our potato growing model demonstrated what we were doing at the time uh, left, had very minimal impact 
residual impact on the, um, on the soil uh, from the nutrients we were using, uh, what it was showing and telling us that we were meeting crop demand as it required and um, as long as our inputs were in line with the, with the model, uh, it was having a pretty minimal impact. Overseer has unfortunately thrown some very variable and highly unreliable results at us, um, but because it's an assumption-based model, uh, it's been very difficult to, um, to get that to line up with what we already know and do. So we've preferred, I guess, to use deep end testing uh, plant tissue test to measure what's in the in the plant, um, along with uh, soil tests for all other nutrients, and use that information, that factual data, uh, with the with the we know um, with the model that we know the plant requires to perform it. We've found over the years that this has been born that evidence of this our, our nitrogen requirements um, post harvest. Uh, have been uh, more for the crops that we in intend to grow. In other words, we're leaving less behind. Uh, farm systems today are, are quite complex. Um, they're totally driven by market drivers. Um, to be efficient um, and to um, commercially be effective, um, you, you're very much driven uh, to be efficient and improve those efficiencies uh, on, a, on an annual basis. Um, but the systems are heavily reliant on crop rotation. Uh, all, sustain all crops require a sustainable rotation, particularly potatoes, and we have found that uh, eight to 10 years is far more reliable in terms of um, our quality and our yields and our performance and the quality of the, um, of the product as opposed to less than that. So uh, because of the area that it requires to grow potatoes uh, to rotate on, we um, are forced to lease ground and, and uh, do so on an annual basis. Uh, it's a key component of, of our sustainable rotation and one that we certainly couldn't uh, operate or grow the area that we do without it. So that's the end of Mr Hewson's um presentation so he can answer any questions you might have of him. Well thank you Mr Hewson. Do you have any questions of Mr Hewson, Commissioner Van Gorthuysen? No, no questions, thank you. Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either, thank you. Very interesting, thank you Mr Hewson. We're grateful to you for coming in. So the next um, presenter to you on behalf of Lovett Family Farms is Dan Lovett. So he'll just come forward and, again, I should have mentioned this before, his case studies and Ms um, McClung's evidence as well, as was the previous speakers. Thank you. Right, morning all. Good morning to you, Mr Lovett, and thank you for coming. No problems. Um, yeah, so um, obviously we're a family-owned business. Um, operating for three generations um, in the company at, uh, at the moment is uh, myself, my mother and father. Uh, we employ 16 full-time staff and um, can, up to, can have up to 50 casuals at different times of the year. Um, we own um, 1,000 hectares and we lease 200 hectares and it's situated in between the Rakaira and the Ashburton River. Uh, we grow around 30 crops at any one time. Um, Obviously, they're all stated there. Um, onions, potatoes, carrots, vegetables are probably our main um, interests and uh, products at the moment. To give you a little bit of background, um, my grandfather farmed in the same area. He was a sheep and crop farmer, far, sheep and crop uh, far, farmer. My father, he's um, been farming in the same area. He's been farming deer, goats, crop, and vegetables. Myself, I've been uh, farming crop, vegetables and berries and uh, I've also got a son and two daughters and what they're going to be farming in the future is probably all our guests, so state that. Um, on the next slide, um, that's uh, all the lo locations that we operate at. Um, so in there is uh, lease land and own land. 
Uh, there's a pack house, um, storage facilities, and also sub base locations. Um, and yeah, mainly on that lease land grown potatoes, onions, beetroot, and carrots. Uh, this slide here shows the, um, the um, nutrient zones. Um, so we obviously have uh, operations that are in different nutrient zones, but we also lease land on farming parcels that are split in between nutrient zones. So you can see one that's in between the, well there's two in between the red and the yellow, and then there's another one on the right hand side that's in between the red and the green. Um, so it's very difficult if we have to manage um, nutrients on an ind individual farm when we can only work on half the farm for one loading and half the farm for an another loading. Um, the, the next slide shows um, obviously the blue squares where our farms and our lease blocks are. Um, there's two, two irrigation schemes highlighted in that, the red scheme and the and the green scheme, the BCI catchment area in the red and the Ashburn Lindhurst in the green. We also have um, another four schemes that are not shown on this with um, the Green Street shareholders scheme and um, uh, there's one other that's slipped my mind. Um, and then we also have individual consents um, for each farm that's uh, not involved in a scheme. So quite a complex um, situation there. Um, so um, our most sustainable tool is our crop rotation. Um, I've done a fair bit of travelling around in, in the world and you go to Washington State for one example and uh, they have got um, three crops, potatoes, wheat and onions and to get their crops to produce, their onions to produce, they're fumigating um, their soil before they can grow their potatoes. So we don't want to go down that path. Um, we want to um, minimise soilborne disease by rotation. We want to reduce fertiliser inputs by crop rotation, whether that's putting peas in or a legume in before we grow different crops. And we're managing to do that and uh, do it well. But to be able to do that, we need to be able to lease land and to be able to spread our risk and our, keep our rotations out long so we don't have to rely on chemistry. Um, uh, important requirements to continue our production um, is managing multiple consents um, will be challenging and inefficient and also will become very costly and time consuming. Um, we're at the moment, we're, we are required to um, be Global Gap certified, as Ross uh, mentioned earlier. Um, we need that for our buyers. Um, and some of the things, I'm not sure if you, under, uh, if you know the um, contents that Global Gap covers, but I thought I'd just read them out. We have in the Global Gap um, certification, we have to go through traceability, propagation material, soil management and conservation, fertiliser application, water management, integrated pest management, plant protection products, equipment, site history and management, record keeping and internal self-inspection, hygiene, workers' health and safety and welfare, subcontractors, waste pollution management, recycling, conservation, complaints, recall withdrawal, food defence, global gap status, logo use, traceability and segregation, mass balance, food safety, policy declaration, and food fraud migration, so mitigation, sorry. So it's quite a um, stringent um, uh, um, process to go through, um, and it's needed all over the world, and um, it's uh, worldly renowned. So yeah. Um, I don't have it, and uh, I think that was, um, yeah. Yeah, so my key points, um, our farms fit into more than one uh, consent pathway, um, lets us use um, the one that's best aligns with our farm. Um, global Gap drives 
the best practices on our farm, um, but not entirely, I think. Um, as a farmer ourselves, um, best practice comes from return and um, cost of production and making the farm profitable. So we don't want to be uh, having disasters, and the way we can do that is by um, not over fertilising, not over watering, and actually um, getting yield. We need to be able to achieve that. And large crop rotation areas are essential by leasing land um, and different arrangements that are in different water zones. Thank you. So that's um, the end of Mr Lovett's um, presentation. So he's, again, available to answer any questions. Um, I just note he read out the Global Gap list. We can get that, if you'd like to have that, we can get that list to you. Yeah. Most of it's in the, in the text that he's I, already given. I, I think it is, sir, so I just wanted to make sure that you were happy that you didn't need that provided separately. So thank you. I've put it on the text he's given us. No, thank the, you. Yeah. You keep pretty well to print. <laughs> Any questions for Mr Lovett, Commissioner Vicky Boyhurston? <clears throat> no, no questions, but just in terms of Global Gap NZ GLAP, just, just to remind you, we've received presentations on that in previous plan change hearings, and we've had lots of documentation on that, so we're familiar with that. And also, that you know, the message about the importance of crop rotations and the fundamental need to lease land for that is a consistent theme that's coming through from yourself and also Potato New Zealand, So, and in previous hearings as well, so we're well aware of that issue, but yeah, thanks for bringing that to our attention again. Thank you. Solomon. No, I have no questions either, thank you. Well, Mr Lovett, thank you very much for your clear explanation. It's been easy to follow and, uh, and helped, of course, by the slides that you've produced. We're grateful for you coming in and presenting it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and just to, just as Mr, I've got uh, Mr Pai, Dean Pai, is coming up to talk to you about um, Pai Produce Limited. And I just wanted to say, I think I've included it in my legal submissions. We note that we've had a consistent um, group of commissioners hearing matters in Canterbury. And what we've done over the years, as have you, is you know things get refined as we try things and decide, well, is this framework going to work? Um, and obviously, we've found along the way that there's been a few hiccups. Um, hence, we're here <laughs> in front of you for Plan Change 7. So we're very, very conscious that you're very familiar both with the growing activities in this uh, region, but also some of the other specific matters. So we haven't tried to reproduce a lot of that here. We, we are looking at this as a continuum of previous presentations. So thanks for reminding me of that, um, Commissioner Van Voorhuizen. Well, one can also respond by saying that it's helpful to have the us too to have the, some continuity of the people who are coming to present before us. And uh, while you were saying that, Mr Ford came in and, and said it with that, and of course he's quite easily recognisable to us. I'm, I'm very pleased he's here, sir. <laughs> so thank you for telling me that. <laughs> now um, we would like to hear from Mr Pye. Mr Pye. Right. So, yeah, morning all. Um, my wife and myself uh, started farming on our own 20, 20 years ago. Um, four children, 1,300-odd hectares. I, I'm probably going to not deviate, but add to it a wee bit. Okay, So range of crops, same as the other boys. In 92, I was fortunate enough to um, be chosen to go to the UK and th well, throughout Europe and um, the States with Teagle Chicken, and the idea of the trip was to increase wheat yields. So back then we were applying, it was taking 50 kilo or 45 kilos of N to produce a tonne of wheat. Through that trip, we, within the next three years, or after that trip, we are now doing it um, for, on about 12 and a half, 13. So where I'm coming from there is the, we've made some serious gains um, over the years, and that has brought about the crop rotation we have. Um, we're not leasing a lot of land. We're pretty much the two two blocks together, and so we've got a. I think we've got a sustainable rotation, um, and I guess we've had a massive focus on. We put it as harvesting in, 
and we adapted the um, deep soiling testing 20-something years ago. When we first started doing that, we were finding we had in in the soil um, at the end of winter up to three to 400 kilos. And um, we've continued to do that through the years. And now we've got it down to 15 to 25. So I guess the harvesting yield, harvesting in thing, uh, we've had some vast improvements. And it's hard, and overseer doesn't see that. We can't, we can't put that into it. Onions, for example, we apply 90 kilos of N plus the 10 that's in the ground, make 100. But yet you put that into overseer, it turns up and says we are leaching over 100 kilos of N. It doesn't make sense. Vegetable seeds, um, we don't put any N on, yet that is it defaults to grass. So, yeah, it's hard to move around, but we've built a um, sustainable um, uh, crop rotation, and yeah, this well, it would handicap us because we'd have to come back on that. But um, the global gap, we've been through that with the other guys, so I don't want to take that off. Um, potato varieties, we've had some. Um, big gains there in, in yield and applied in. So if you divide them out per tonne, you know, we've more than halved the amount of in going on uh, the ground per tonne. Yep. Um, yeah, that's probably, that you can see what's there. Any questions here? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the end of his um, presentation. So if there are any questions of Mr Pai. Mr. No questions, thank you. Mr. Solomon? No, none from me either, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Pai. Please understand that uh, what you've come to present to us is very clear, and uh, we thank you for your information. Thank you. So, um, so that brings us, we've got a grower that we've still to hear from later on in the day um, when they can get here. Um, <laughs> So the next, so that was the Peel View Orchard, which is the next presentation. We'll come back to that uh, when those growers arrive. Um, so what we're now moving into is the specialist technical team. So if you're just happy for us to keep on going um, without a break, we can do that. Well, we'll, we'll take a break at some convenient time. But that, no, no, it's probably a bit early. I was looking at the um, clock as well. So I just thought we'd, I'd just give you that opportunity to... Um, take a quick pause. Mm. Yes, let, let's do that now. If you've got that's a sensible time, thank you for the suggestion. We'll break the quarter of an hour now. Thank you, sir. Well, I think we're nearly ready, Ms. Atkins, if you'd yes, like to continue. Thank you, sir. Yes, so just, um, I'll just quickly introduce Mr. Nation, who's done the spatial assessment. Um, included in his evidence dated the 17th of July. And just to remind you that. Um, the very important um, correction to his evidence was to ensure that the table in his evidence, which will also be duplicated uh, in the slides, which have now been corrected, um, included the wrong uh, number. It included the 600 hectare growth area as opposed to the 1,000. So I just wanted to make that clear um, at the beginning of his um, presentation. So similar to the growers, um, what Mr Nation's done is summarise the key points of his evidence in the PowerPoint presentation and he'll take you through those and then obviously be available at the end to answer any questions you have, um, you know, detailed questions you have regarding his evidence. So I'll hand it over to him. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr Nation. Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, yes, so I'm Tom Nation. I'm a spatial analyst um, and I've been asked by Horticulture New Zealand to assess the effect uh, horticultural expansion would have on nitrogen leaching uh, and load values. So um, I've carried out a GIS-based assessment to evaluate the nitrogen load impact on the Canterbury sub-regional chapter catchments uh, for three scenarios. So the first one uh, was looking at the expansion under the proposed permitted activity rule and, and uh, what that would look like if it went from 0.5 hectares to 5 hectares. Um, the potential expansion uh, area in each sub-catchment uh, if we were to take 0.5 and 1% uh, load increases for each of those subcatchments, um, and what the, the corresponding um, expansion area could be. 
uh, and the area available for root vegetable rotations uh, to expand within the existing grand parented uh, nitrogen load. So the, the image on the, on the right there, the, the black boundaries, <coughs> uh, the sub-regional chapter catchment boundaries, and, and the green is the uh, land use capability one and two land that zone rural and uh, isn't currently horticulture. So the land use and the assessment essentially uh, that could be considered uh, to expand onto for horticulture. Uh, so, one. so in order to carry out the assessment, um, a baseline data set was created using GIS data and, and tools. Um, so the first part of it uh, was to apply leaching, nitrogen leaching rates to uh, each of the land uses on that LUC 1 and 2 land you saw on the first slide. Um, and it, the leaching race, rates are based on um, a table, which I'll show you soon. Um, the average leaching rate was calculated for LUC 1 and 2 land in each subcatchment. Um, and then this rate was subtracted from a range of vegetable growing rotation uh, leaching rates. So essentially to identify the difference um, and leaching on that land um, due to horticulture um, land use change. Uh, and, then, and then we, um, yes, so I'll, I'll continue on a, a bit further on. So on that image on the right there, that just uh, is an example of the, the land use split on that land use capability one and two land. Um, and the data has been taken from the agri-based data set provided by Environment Canterbury. So this is the, these are the nitrogen leaching rates um, that have been used in the assessment. The average end load in the middle column there, that's uh, what I've applied to uh, the majority of this work. Uh, the last scenario, scenario C, looked at the variation, um, which I can explain a bit later. Um, yes. So the, the first scenario I looked at um, was to look at the effect altering the permitted cap uh, of the rule 5.4.2 CA from 0.5 hectares to 5 hectares. Um, so that expansion, that could result in another 3.6 hectares of increased growing land. Um, so we, we looked at the NT gap database uh, and everyone under that cap currently and brought them up to that level um, and identified uh, what the uh, increase in hectares would be, but also what the change in nitrogen would be based on um, an intensive growing rotation relative to the average on, on the possible land they'll expand onto. Um, we also did that, we tested the same thing if the cap wasn't 0.5 hectares but was 5 hectares um, and that could result in an additional 155 hectares of growing land. Um, and throughout this, um, we've used the uh, intensive vegetable rotation, uh, the average at 42 kilogram per hectare per year. So the corresponding effect on nitrogen is detailed in that, de in that table below, and the last column being, you know, the percentage uh, of the total catchment load uh, up to that five hectare cap. Um, so the second scenario was to look at um, uh, future domestic demand. Um, uh, so we looked at... Um, assessing the potential area of expansion based on a 0.5% nitrogen load increase at the catchment level and also a 1%. Uh, we looked at the four different growing rotations and then identify what the corresponding expansion area could be if those subcatchments were to increase by that percentage. The, in addition to that, what we looked at was what the percentage load increase would be to meet the 1,000 hectares um, that Rachel mentioned in the, in the evidence. 1,000 hectares was based on um, uh, what, what would be required for a future population growth in Canterbury. So the 0 0.8, uh, approximately 0.08% of the nitrogen load increased to meet the 1,000 hectares, and that's um, in the most intensive rotation. So that, that might be the clarification there, that last line in that table um, may have said 0.7 um, and a slightly different number. Um, so yes. And the last scenario I looked at uh, involved using the baseline GIS data set that I've used for the first two um, and calculated the area that root vegetables could expand onto within the existing nitrogen load. So essentially looking at the table on the right, which we've already looked at, 
looking at the 15% variation in around the, the average nitrogen load and, uh, and applying and using the AgriBase data set and some of the data I've already looked at, uh, assessing what that would look like if we were to um, move horticulture land onto um, either existing, so the couple of examples there I've used are arable and dairy land. So essentially what that's saying is that if there's about 9,932 hectares of arable land with a nitrogen leaching rate of 32 kilogram per hectare per year, so that's in the upper 15%, um, and in that table on the left there, you can see that root vegetables in the lower leaching rate um, could, could <laughs> fit on that land. Um, and the same thing, I've put another example there of, of arable, sorry, and I've put another example there of dairy land. So that's essentially looking at the variation around the mean, around the average nitrogen load, um, and we did a 15 to 15 to 70% split across uh, the land use, to apply, to apply these um, examples, uh, and so that's that's me. Any any questions? So yes, that's the end of Mr. Nation's presentation. Um, obviously, you have his evidence. So it's, um, if there's any questions of him. Um. Yes. Thank you. Questions, Commissioner Van Gorsen. Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nation. You've given us a clear and expanded presentation. We're grateful to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, the next um, witness in our group of experts is Susan Goodfellow. So, again, I'll just grab Susan's statement of evidence. So you have a statement of evidence from Susan, again dated the 17th of July, um, and uh, I'll just introduce you to Sue, but Susan and let her take you through the presentation and then, like the others, answer any questions you may have of her. Just, just, just the rules of line up, I Thank you, Ms. Goodfellow. Good. Uh, we're grateful to present your evidence. And uh, if you'd like now to proceed with your summary, I'll be Thank you, and good morning. Um, look, before I talk about our vision at Left Field Innovation, I'd just like to um, talk about my role here today. And I see that my work is, is less technical than the team I'm a part, part of today, but I'm really linking the market and particularly the market opportunities for domestic and export growth for, that meets horticulture New Zealand's aspiration for increasing vegetable production across New Zealand and, and in particular Canterbury, um, and thus the economic and employment benefits for New Zealand, and linking those market opportunities with the growers that you've heard from this morning that are future-focused farmers that are innovative and invest in continual improvement of farm practices and new plant genetics to increase outputs and reduce um, the impacts on the environment. And then finally, looking at linking the standards that farmers comply to, particularly the global standards and certifications um, that communicate excellence to consumers that care about food quality and safety and the environmental uh, impacts of food production. So they're the three pillars that I'll be talking through today. Leafield Innovation was established relatively recently in the last three years with a vision of enabling 100,000 hectares of sustainable land use across New Zealand that is market-led or consumer-led that produces high-value agri-food products for domestic and global markets for the benefit of the primary sector, our people and our country. With this mighty lofty vision, we created the blueprint in Canterbury and we have established a f approximately 5,000 hectare grower group, some of those growers you've heard from this morning, that farm mixed systems that include arable, veg vegetable and stock. <coughs> Connecting our growers with consumers is critical going forward. 
We can grow many things in New Zealand, we know that, but does the market want it? So understanding what consumers care about and understanding their preferences is influencing land use choices for farmers. We know that the established values of taste, convenience and nutrition have uh, driven consumers' uh, purchasing behaviours in the past, but we also know that they're changing. And the emerging values around nutrition, including food authenticity and safety, around environmental considerations that include production impacts and food waste, and the ethics of production, and particularly fair trade, the social and labour um, components as well. So they are drivers that we must understand and that Leafield is driven to understanding as part of our market-led approach. We hear a lot about provenance of food and telling our story, but we need to move away from storytelling to truth-telling. And to this end, Leafield, working with our grower groups, have utilised the data that farmers currently capture through very various platforms that they input their data that's collected for regulatory purposes. We repurpose that and communicate to the consumer how that food has been grown, where it has been grown, how it has been grown. We provide information about the farm, about the nutritional content of the food, the suitability standards, now this is where the likes of the Global Gap certification would come into it. And then we link all that through, because obviously there are many different certifications um, and suitability standards globally uh, and nationally. And the common language that we've chosen is the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. So a consumer can scan this app using the QR code it brings up this information and they can dive into the detail around where their foods come from and how it's being produced. And this is something we've pilot, piloted in Canterbury with our Canterbury farms, using data that would have been used for regulatory purposes, but providing a value add to the farmers and capturing more value from them um, in relation to their production and farm practices. But we see that Regulation is key to enabling innovation. The market-led sustainable vegetable production aligns with the global demand for plant-based food, so we can tick that box. We can do that very well. Um, Canterbury is very well posi positioned to grow high value, further grow the high-value um, vegetable opportunities here through the mixed farming system. Um, that we have. We're also obviously closely located to the port and the airport, so very well positioned to make the most of Canterbury as, as our food bowl. As I said, consumer preferences are changing. They're becoming more selective about, um, particularly the consumers that New Zealand can target around high value. Um, and so understanding those emerging trends around nutrition, environmental and ethic concerns links to our growers and research organisations being able to innovate their systems and their practices to continually improve to meet consumer demand. And we have found that the consumer expectations are actually higher than the regulatory expectations in many regards. But we need to capture this data, as farmers do, and tell that authentic story and link it to the food. And the story includes the health, the soil health, the carbon footprint, biodiversity, the GE-free uh, component of the food product, and the social responsibility and fair trade, as I've mentioned, and various other credent attributes that I mentioned in my statement. Linking these standards, which includes the Global Gap Certification Programme, um, meets via this app, meets the expectations and the, the the other benefit is it allows compliance as well. So in an environment where we have this market-led uh, opportunity and flexibility, a key enabler of sustainable land use diversification in Canterbury will be a regulatory framework for commercial veg vegetable production within PC7 that allows flexibility and innovation in the what, we can, what can be farmed, how it can be farmed and where it can be farmed. This will enable farmers to innovate to ensure the environmental impacts are minimised and managed. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, any questions of Ms Goodfellow? 
Commissioner Van Voorhuizen. Uh, no, no questions, but I see in your evidence you describe yourself as an agri-food solutions enabler, so I guess that would make me a regional plan improvements enabler. <laughs> there you go. It's all about positive. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's got a nicer catch here, it does, think, Commissioner. It? <laughs> it's the future focus, yeah. But no questions, thank you. Commissioner Solomon. Yes, I do have a couple of questions for Miss Goodfellow. Um, commercial vegetable production in New Zealand appears to be ahead of the game compared to all other types of farming in New Zealand with regard to social responsibility and credence attributes for capitalising on what the global, global market is asking for. The application that Left Field developed is impressive and will support growers to improve their practices. Do you know if there's any other equivalent um, like that application or even global gap accreditation system based on credence attributes and a similar marketing strategy and software application for all other farming types in New Zealand? Look, I think that that's a very interesting question. And when we, um, before we started to develop the app, we did an audit on what is currently out there. And there's lots of bits and pieces is probably the answer, but nothing that's actually consolidated end to end. So it's taken the farm data that currently is available through various farm portals. And for our test case, we used production wise, but could have used any farm platform. So there, there are a number of standards as well, but they may not link to farm data or to the market. So there's a lots of bits, mm. and through our audit, we identified that we needed to join those components up, which is what we've done. I think there are other things underway with some of the, um, the you know, Fonterra and Zespri and the likes, but um, again, they're probably very bespoke to that particular product, whereas our approach is to be agnostic and allow um, a number of different land uses to be incorporated. I can congratulate Hort New Zealand for being so innovative and ahead of the game. Um, <clears throat> at your paragraph 25, you've got a um, diagram, and it's just a curious question, um, that is titled Established Values and Emerging Values. Yes. Under the ethics, what, what is meant by patriotism? Um, that's often to do with, it's a sort of a bit like nationalism, I guess you could say, where pe people have become very uh, patriotic around their food and value um, food produced in New Zealand, for example. So we may, right. we may purchase New Zealand food consciously over something that's imported, and that really looks to um, increase the demand domestically, for example. A lot of countries in the UK, for example, are very patriotic around purchasing um, locally made, and that really does help drive a local economy. That, that makes sense, thank you. Um, and at your paragraph 39, just to go the other way, we have read Dr Chim Chamber, Tim Chambers' evidence on behalf of CCC, which said that groundwater and nutrient-laden vegetables may be the cause of adverse health effects, um, and he uses the example of colorectal cancer, I know it's not your area of expertise, but do you have a view on this with regard to social responsibility, vegetable production, and credence attributes, and global marketing? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think my the um, section 39 um, relates to something that was stated in uh, one of the farmers' evidence. But look, I think this is where the traceability around the nutritional attributes of food will expose, um, particularly around how it's being produced, linked to the nutritional content, should expose and un unravel um, the quality for the consumer and enable them to make conscious decisions around um, the, the types of nutrition that they're purchasing. I think it's not intrinsically linked there right now, but ultimately if we can be very transparent around the practices and tra transparent around what that means to the nutritional content, then those two essentially can be joined up and help inform those decisions. And I guess it, it um, would complement your truth storytelling. Um. Mm -mm. Look, I, I think one thing I'd like to add around the grower group is, and this is probably an indirect way of answering your question, is that it's values-based and we undertake a values assessment for each of the growers because we see that going forward in the future, it's not just about an economic imperative, it's about 
all of the environment, social, cultural and economic. And so we, in our group, need to make sure that the farmers that are participating share those values of creating a win for themselves, a win for the group, but a win for our society. And so that's, that's the starting point. And I think that allows, that leads to transparency and an ethical approach to the way they farm and, and what they stand for. So it sort of is a circular, a circular approach around doing the right thing. Great, thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you. It's a, a good start for a, a witness <laughs> is to say that she's going to move away from storytelling to truth telling. <laughs> yes, very good start. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hope we Good all learn from that. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. So now I'm just going to bring, um, probably um, it, it's a good time to bring forward Mr Farrelly, who um, I th may you may have had him present to you before, but he's um, responsible at Hort NZ for the New Zealand GAP programme. He's had a lot of experience um, discussing the way in which that can be used in the Canterbury situation. Um, so I'm yes. going to leave him to take you through um, his presentation um, and answer any questions on that um, and his evidence. Thank you. Good morning, Mr Farrelly. Thank you very much. You're going to present in the same way. We've read your, your evidence statement. And you're going to present it now in the summary form. And do you have some graphics to go with it? Yes, um, yes, sir. They should be on the on your screen, um, or the set, the next after Ms. Goodfellow's presentation in the PowerPoint. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. So um, we've heard a lot about Global Gap this morning, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on that and um, later. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, Global Gap being uh, European head office in Cologne in Germany, and is a global standard. NZ Gap in New Zealand based in Wellington and um, benchmarked to Global Gap so that if a grower does need Global Gap certification, we have that integration. Um, but in terms of what we've done uh, for ECAN is developed an environment add-on that meets those farm environment plan requirements, especially for an audited farm environment plan. So while using that same framework, Global Gap and NZ Gap, essentially the same assurance framework, um, we've developed the detail around what is required to meet um, Plan Change 7 uh, via the, the Environment Management System add-on. Um, so a little bit of an overview of where we are with, with farm environment plans in, in Canterbury. So we developed the module to meet all the, the various areas around soil, nutrients, irrigation, waterways, biodiversity. Um, so it meets the... the the standards meet the regulatory requirements for the content of a farm environment plan. And um, we've got a section on nutrient management, which um, has is based the practices and risk assessments based on the Horden Z Code of Practice for Nutrient Management. Um, and then we link in with nutrient management tools or budgets such as Overseer, Landwise, and others, uh, NCHEC in Canterbury also. And uh, with the amendment to the RMA, Section 9A, expected to fully expect to get accepted as a certified freshwater farm plan pathway, similar to what um, the recognition that has been achieved in Canterbury. Looking at the overall assurance framework, uh, a little bit complicated, just want to emphasize that the assurance framework for ENSA Gap and Global Gap are, are very similar. And the real critical component is on the left, where we have um, the third party uh, credibility that but underpins the trust in the system. So NZ Gap establishes the, the standards, um, but they're independently audited by conformity assessment bodies. Uh, Assurer Quality and SGS are the two current uh, CABs that we use. And then there's oversight from uh, accreditation bodies who have oversight from, from MB and um, Minister of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Um, so it's not NZ Gap acting in isolation, um, telling that telling consumers or regulators or supermarkets that growers are meeting the requirements, we have that independent component to it. So looking at a little bit more in the detail of that, that diagram, um, the first thing that we would do is, uh, with this environment add-on is benchmark to the requirements. So um, benchmark to Plan Change 7. Uh, previously, Plan Change 5 was also accepted for Plan Change 5. Um, any relevant guidelines and codes of practice um, and in terms of hierarchy, if there's a generic code of practice for nutrient management, we benchmark to that. If there's a crop-specific guideline, then that can be adopted in as well. 
Um, once we have the benchmarking done, or probably in parallel, we're working with regulators like ECAN and uh, to make sure that we've got everything in place uh, to meet the requirements ongoing. Um, so benchmark is completed, we get the recognition. We're now in the implementation phase where a number of growers have adopted the EMS in Canterbury. Um, there's a range of business types in, in horticulture where um, and how the growers manage their market access and their the management on their gap. So um, individual growers, a lot of the growers that spoke today are those individually certified. Um, large corporates or very small growers operate under a, kind of a, a central management system called a multi-site. And then um, another central management system is called the grower group or producer group. And um, familiar with, with Zespri, that is a, an example of a, of a grower group where and there's one certificate, one Global Gap certificate in their case, uh, across a number of production sites. Um, and in an ECAN context, that would be sort of similar to a, 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 an irrigation scheme where people are acting, acting as a collective. Um, the independent audit happens at that level uh, for, the, for the individual multi-site and grower groups. And if there are any issues, then um, certification can be suspended or cancelled, but growers do have time to make corrective actions. So in year one, it's up to three months, um, and then ongoing, once they're certified, they have a 28-day period to, to close out non-compliances. Um, growers call this the, the teeth in the scheme, so it is a bit of an exclusive club. You have to meet the standards to, be, um, to become certified. And um, if there are any issues or people get suspended, uh, ejected from the scheme, in our reporting processes, we are escalating those to Environment Canterbury. Um, the last area that we are doing more in now, because things are getting complicated, is the support area, so advisors and workshops. Um, from, a, from a grower's point of view, a lot of the growers that are here this morning, and uh, many growers around the country have the same views that growers need to really understand what, what they have to do and really buy into it. And if they can't meet the requirements, then they probably shouldn't be growing sort of attitude. Um, I'm, I, I can see that side, but I can also um, see the growers have a lot on their plate. They're dealing with things from lots of angles. So um, realize that having that support network is, is important. And also to get uh, implementation of our latest research and guidelines as they come out to get those disseminated, then we can see that support network of advisors has been really important. So we're developing that now for establishing that. Um, in terms of the credibility, again, I um, could have added some images this to this to explain a bit more. Um, but just the audit process itself, um, there is there is a strong emphasis on records, like the Farm Environment Plan itself, and the components of that, the risk assessment, the good management practices, and um, in subsequent audits, the action plan, have the growers actually taken the actions that were expected of them. Um, but then the auditor also goes on site, interviews the grower, and sees, do they actually understand the content of their FUP and uh, are they buying into what the, is expected of them? And then also do a farm walk. So a grower might say they have buffer strips and it might be in their farm environment plan, but the owner will do a walk of the farm to make sure that those are in place and are up to standard. And um, finally then on ECAN, so recognized um, last in April last year for Plant Change 5 and um, updated to Plan Change 7 when that was notified uh, in November, and that got accepted in December last year. Um, and in terms of recognition, ECAN haven't just recognized the, the template, they've also recognized the assurance system and the audits. And um, so Enza Gap and Sin Libre Pride are the only two accredited schemes in Canterbury currently. And um, my work in other regions is, is, is leveraging off that, so it's been quite a good thing that uh, Enza Gap has achieved the accreditation in, in Canterbury, but also looking at central government recognition that will make it <coughs> more streamlined for other regions because ECAN have a lot of experience in this area, other councils not so much. And um, so if they can leverage off that central government recognition, then ENSA Gap can get on with implementation rather than uh, I suppose going around the recognition processes. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. So yes, yeah, so any, any questions? Question? I just I wanted to add, um, it's been quite hard work for horticulture New Zealand to get recognition elsewhere, and so it's been recognised in Canterbury. I mean, it's mentioned relatively recently, but in fact, you will recall us talking to you about this for many, many years ago, and it's been um, fabulous to see it um, being used and properly implemented in Canterbury, but um, 
Mr Farrelly's understating how difficult it's been in other regions. So thank you for your part in that because it has been a really helpful uh, process but it's been very painful elsewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. So, possible questions, Mr Farrelly? Mr Van Gordon? He's just got a couple of questions from the evidence in chief that was pre-circulated. Um, first one's at paragraph 26 and 27. You don't need to turn to those particular paragraphs, but the question is, what percentage of Canterbury growers use the EMS add-on? So I um, don't have the stats on the total growers or areas. I have the NZGAF Roughly. data. So um, in NZGAF, we have 140 growers, and 13 so far are in the EMS. Um, in terms of area, that's 12,000 hectares in NZ Gap, 3,000 currently in the EMS. So while we've got a small number of growers, we've got nearly 25% of the area. So can you, <coughs> sorry, I didn't catch you the areas. What? Um, so in summary, 140 growers, yep. 12,000 hectares, yep. 13 growers, 3,000 hectares. Okay. Yeah. Um, and of that, 45% of that EMS area is lease land. Okay. And how might you expect that to change in the coming years? Rapidly increase. So the rec ECAN recognition has um, has helped get started. Um, a lot of growers are probably in a holding pattern at the moment because of Plan Change 7, but we have a lot of appetite for um, getting going on implementation, a lot of requests for workshops, we have been doing these in other regions, and um, so growers are highly engaged and wanting to get uh, wanting to get going with their farm environment plans. And yeah. um, what I don't have information on is the growers that are in irrigation schemes who will have farm environment plans, mm. that pathway, so may choose to maintain that as their pathway for an audited farm environment plan, or they might, they might decide to use the EMS and then um, get that, that outcome from that pass into the irrigation schemes audit system. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. And then at um, paragraph 48, you say you do not support the requirement for a nutrient budget for a commercial vegetable growing activity and that it should be removed from the minimum content of an FEP. And I was just curious about that Interesting. because from your presentation, I understand a nutrient budget is part of the NZ Gap EMS requirement, so I'm not quite sure why you're asking us to remove it from the FEP. So I think a point of clarification there <laughs> is needed. Um, I, that should be on a, a mandatory overseer nutrient budget, um, completely supportive of nutrient budgeting and um, growers having decision support tools, um, supportive of the NCHEC approach, which gives growers uh, a number without the, the cost associated with an, uh, an overseer budget that we've heard from this morning. And the, the research and tools have moved on considerably, considerably in recent years where growers can really optimise their nutrient management uh, nutrients within their system with better decision support tools like the Landwise tool that's in my presentation. Um, so it's not a no nutrient budget, it's a non-mandatory overseer budget. <coughs> So apologies for not making that more clear. And then in your paragraphs 51, 50, 51, 52, and 53, mm -hmm. uh, you recommend a rewrite of the FEP content, tabular format, collation of cultural values, addition of an option for the ISO accredited program, etc. I couldn't see where that was set out in the original Hort New Zealand submission, those four requests. And is, first of all, is Hort New Zealand still seeking that as relief? And if so, where in the submission is it specified? Um, I think what we have done, I'll just check it for you. <coughs> I think you're right, there wasn't any specific requirement for those um, specific things. They are matters dear to Mr Farrelly's heart um, yeah. as he's been working through all of the issues he's mentioned to you today. Yeah. But actually, because we haven't specifically requested it, 
it won't be within scope for you to make those changes. Okay. But what I can say, and, and, and part of the reason we've brought to your attention some of the things we've brought to your attention and accepted some of them are outside of scope, is a bit of a signal to both the council and future decision makers that these are the sorts of things we're going to have to work on yep. in the not too distant future um, because there will be some plan changes arising if I need to deal with the MPSFM 2020. So it's a bit of a flag, we'll be back um, <laughs> with, with making sure we've got scope to have those included. Yeah. All right, no, thank you for clarifying that. No further questions, thank you. Commissioner Solomon. <coughs> Yes, well, um, I was actually going to ask about uh, your paragraph 52, but because it's not in scope, well, then we'll leave it that question for a future plan change. Yes, I think, and that's an interesting one because you might have seen the rebuttal evidence of Mr Hodgson has picked up in relation to, area, you know, being more specific about areas where perhaps growing needs to be excluded. Um, he has accepted um, the evidence of uh, Naitahu in that respect. Um, so we've got scope in relation to that point, but in terms of the FEP, um, what Mr Farrelly is really signalling there is the importance of making sure that we, we're continuing to be continually improving um, and uh, updating those requirements um, as and when we can to make sure we don't fall behind in terms of those things. Um, his view, because oh, I've spoken to him about this and he can talk to you about this too, it's increasingly becoming very important for these matters to be included as part of the overall um, farm environment plan preparation process. So I don't know whether you wanted to add. Yeah, sure. I think the, the, the general approach here is about the, the structure of it. And um, in, ENZIGAP has developed the environment add-on as a, a national system, but with um, regional significance. And to benchmark to the FEP content is, is quite difficult in the current format. Um, so to have a, a structured system that's easy to interpret, what are the key objectives and targets, what do I need to do to meet this regional and sub-regional plan requirements, um, it's difficult at the moment. There's duplication and there's uh, confusion. So um, for, for NZGAP to go through that process, um, I found it quite difficult. So I can imagine someone trying to interact with it, what is the requirement on this piece of land in this sub-catchment would be difficult. So. Um, it's not about, uh, as, as Helen says, it's about making improvements, but also just making sure that the structure is um, clear and concise so that people can clearly see what applies to them. And then for the likes of NZ Gap, it's a, a personal thing that would make it easier for me, but I'm not I'm more interested in how easy it is for people to interpret what are the real requirements for their, for their sub-catchment. Yes, well, I'm not sure whether you, were, you wouldn't have known we heard from Naitahu yesterday, and one of their issues is to have rock art, for instance, under a, a farm environment plan because it takes specialist knowledge to understand what impacts, to identify if a rock art site's been impacted on. Um, so they've asked us not to include rock art sites, for instance, under an FEP, and even though we haven't made that decision, I've just given you that heads up. Okay. No, thank, thank you. you. I have no more questions. Thank you. Just a counterpart to the question by Colin, the Mr. Van Potter's master, Mr. Barry, you were able to tell him that the 140 growers who are on the gap system in, in Canterbury. So how many growers does that leave in Canterbury who are not on the gap system? So I have just identified the NZ gap. Um, others that we heard from this morning are using global gap, so they are not included in those numbers. I see. And um, there are other growers I'm not aware of the, un the uncertified, but at a national level, we say about 90% of growers are certified because there is no market access option without certification. And um, I don't have the numbers, the exact numbers for Canterbury specifically, but it would likely fall into that, um, that category. Um, yeah, without, without ends of GAP or global GAP certification, fresh produce doesn't really have a market domestically or export. 
Right. Well, thank you. That's interesting. And uh, we're grateful to you for your full and clear statement of evidence and presumably to get to that. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, sir. Um, so our next um, witness is Mr Andrew Barber. Um, and just following on from um, Mr Farrelly, he's going to drill, drill down, excuse the pun, a little bit further in terms of um, these farm um, environment plans and some of the practical um, issues that he's been working on in, in this region and in others. So like the others, um, he's produced a statement of evidence and there's a PowerPoint presentation which summarises the key matters he wants to bring to your attention. Well, Mr. Barber, we have read your evidence statement. Very good. And we're looking forward to your presentation of the summary of the slides. Very good. Thank you. Uh, just to kick off, I do have a dry throat. It's not COVID. Um, so if I cough, I've, I held a cough in for the entire flight down. So um, um, I can't guarantee that uh, that this time. <laughs> he was worried that he was <laughs> Yeah, at 30,000 feet. <laughs> Um, so we've heard a lot from the growers um, about uh, farm environment plans. And so I thought it'd be quite good just to put it into context for the what we think of um, and where farm environment plans fit into the New Zealand um, horticultural strategy. Um, so we, we have, a, we have a, a structure that we call joining the dots that you see there, and it's all about how do you go from problem recognition um, around actually getting stuff done uh, and then, and then getting that assured through a um, um, through, through a assurance scheme, and ultimately, how do you then report uh, report that in your? Um, I was going to say storytelling, but I'm, I'm, I need to change that now to truth telling. Um, so, FEPs are one component of of that system. Um, absolutely, um, 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 absolutely vital component of that system. However, they don't sit within that system without problem being recognised. So if you don't recognise the problem, then you're not going to um, um, uh, make a change. Uh, so, so, so problem recognition sits, sits right at the beginning of that. FEPs are underpinned by research, and, and I've got a, a few examples of those that I'll, that I'll run through shortly. But so, so you've got problem recognition. A grower recognises the problem uh, and, and through their product groups initiates, initiates research. Invariably, out of that research comes, come, comes guidelines, um, often on the 30th of June, because that's the deadline, uh, and, and, and codes of practice that, that kind of sit there. The good thing, and I think the really strong aspect about, about farm environment plans, is they actually create that structure from how do you go from, go from actually having a guideline, having a code of practice, to actually getting stuff done. Uh, and the farm environment plans are a way of structuring that. So you so so you 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 identify what the uh, practice needs to be, the good practice uh, uh, or, the, or the best practice, and you put that into your action plan. So it creates structure. We, I ran, I run various projects, and you talk about a time for implementation, and and ten years later, you know, you might look around and see uh, and and see a reasonably unlevel playing field because some have done it and others haven't. The massive, massive advantage of farm environment plans is that they put a structure to that time for implementation. Uh, and there's a date and there's a, um, um, I mean, there's a person who is responsible for, for delivering that, um, that particular mitigation. Uh, the, assurance, the assurance scheme through, through NZ Gap then gives the councils and ultimately uh, the customers um, assurance that uh, things have been done, um, and, and and that's independently audited. And finally, I talk I talk about reporting. So that's again, it can be reporting back on a number of levels. It can it can be reporting back to the growers if it's a if it's a guideline um, a measure that that they're looking to um, um, to improve um, improve upon and and compare themselves to other growers. Equally, it can be reporting back to council uh, uh, or ultimately reporting back to our reporting back to the growers' customers. This is this, this is the structure of a farm environment plan. So what 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 we have under the NZ Gap EMS is you'll see out there on the right is the third party third party auditor. They they work off the off the checklist, and and sitting underneath that that checklist is the EMS template. So 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 in that read the read the farm environment plan. 
and what we say within the NZ GAP system is it can be the EMS, it can be the, um, um, the template that's been developed, or it could be any other approved uh, um, farm environment plan. But ultimately, whichever way you go, they have the same structure. Every, every aspect of those farm environment plans have, have the same structure. They, they do a risk assessment, uh, they identify and select good management practices, and, and if somebody is answering a partial or a no to a particular good management practice, then that then goes through to their action plan. Uh, I talked to, talk to growers about the, you know, they, they roll their eyes at the 19-page farm environment plan, uh, and I tell them, well, that's, that's fine for the first year, um, you do need to work your way through that, but ultimately it comes down to the action plan, and the action plan's one pager. And quite frankly, that's the thing that needs to be laminated and stuck up on the, uh, stuck up on the wall, um, and that's what they work to. You know, we're about actually getting stuff done. Um. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> crop rotations, you might be sick of hearing about this. Um, um, crop, crop rotations and cover crops, I will be brief. Um, you've heard from, uh, um, 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 heard from the growers about the absolute um, um, essence of having, of having crop rotations and cover crops um, for, their, for their systems. Uh, and you've heard a lot about to actually incorporate these cover crops and these expanded rotation systems to reduce your intensity, um, you obviously need, uh, uh, need, need more land. Uh, you'll, you'll see on that final point in 3, 3D talking about deep, deep rooting plants, um, mining, mining nutrients. Um, so that's the idea that if you have a, um, a more extensive system, you might uh, have a crop that comes through like a maize um, that can mop up some of the um, um, some of the uh, the nitrogen at the end of a, a more intensive crop. So again, it's just absolutely vital, and I um, I just yeah reiterate what the growers have said. It's a it's a it's a you you need a bigger footprint bigger footprint, but it's less uh, but, but it's less intensive. Uh, on the right there, you'll see the um, um, you'll see, see, see the joining the dots. So just a, just as a bit of a, a bit of an example of how we work our way through it. So I've highlighted there this part of the story, which is around research and the codes of practice. Erosion sediment control is a really good example. Um, it's a it, it's one that I'll work through briefly for you, just to give you the idea. But under erosion sediment, reeds also re, read nutrients, uh, you know, and um, um, sort health. It's it's. It's the process which, which I really want to emphasise. So you'll see there that on the left-hand side is the erosion and sediment control guidelines. So that's that's that that's the code of practice that the growers um, that the growers have. It's a it's a list of uh, good and best management practices, um, well described, uh, and, and 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 sits there as a resource that farm environment plans can link into. Um, I've been giving a few uh, a few uh, uh, talks around the country, of course, to various um, um, plan changes. They seem to be quite popular. Uh, and and get grilled, or you know, five, ten years ago, got grilled on the numbers. Um, so we had a code of practice, and was often then grilled on the numbers. So the research needs to come in behind and establish the numbers for um, for people to have confidence. That's very much what that project, Don't Muddy the Waters, was about. It was, as you can see by the uh, plethora of logos there. Uh, uh, yeah, it's across the industry. It involved the Ministry for the Environment, uh, Ministry for um, Primary Industries. Uh, and put numbers around the um, um, around the practice, and so equally, uh, um, it's a it's a component uh, of the of the whole system, and that's what we um, and that's how we justify the the practices eventually. Um, specifically, specifically for um, for Canterbury, um, so. Canterbury has extremely low erosion um, um, erosion rates. It's generally um, um, generally very very, very flat. Uh, um, certainly certainly flatter than flatter than Auckland, uh, <laughs> and and consequently even unmitigated, um, you have erosion rates that, that that other parts of the country would dream about, um, of around 0.3 tonnes per hectare. Um, when you incorporate various mitigation measures measures such as you know vegetable buffer strips, cover crops. Then you drive that erosion rate um, e and, um, uh, uh, even lower, uh, down to down to around that 0.1 tonnes per hectare. Uh, and certainly, the thing about farm environment plans you saw you saw before the, the first aspect is a risk assessment. So you're doing the risk assessment, uh, uh, and definitely within Canterbury for this aspect, um, it will come out as a very um, 
and very low, uh, low, low risk. I thought, it's, I thought it'd be helpful just to give you an idea of what does this actually look like in practice. So what is a, what is a, you know, we talk about farm environment plans, um, what does it actually look like in practice? This is, this is one of the pages. Uh, and you'll see down that list, this is, this is with regards to a risk, um, uh, um, risk assessment, a paddock assessment, um, and the growers work through these, work through these practices. Uh, the first one you'll see there is identify site-specific risks. The grower in this case uh, uh, has a process for doing that, and so, and so, so ticks yes, uh, and the evidence that they can then show to the auditor is uh, they'll, they'll have a, in their, in their folder or in their material there, they'll, they'll have things that show that they, they know what the slope is, for example, uh, and, and on their maps they'll have, you know, they'll have their, their waterways um, identified. So likewise, the, you know, the growers just kind of work their, work their way through that. Uh, you'll see at the bottom there identified things like where does surface water enter and leave the paddock. Uh, and again, the growers then make a comment and, and provide evidence to the auditor to show that they have, uh, have considered that as part of their risk assessment. We talk a lot about within erosion sediment control um, um, various mitigations. The one that I've just highlighted here, and again, just just keep in mind, this is this is one mitigation amongst a amongst a toolbox of mitigations, is the use of vegetated buffer strips and and in this case shelter belts. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the first photo is November 2015. What was the um, and, and what the situation was there? You see a you know a, a reasonably Small, narrow buffer strip next to next to a drain, um, and predominantly weeds, uh, and then by 2000, oh, 2019, you'll see how that's transitioned. It's the same. It's the same paddock, uh, and you'll see it's transitioned into a much wider, um, 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 denser buffer strip. And I guess I guess the point that I'm really trying to make is that the advantage of having these industry-driven codes of practice and farm environment plans um, and and it being grower led, is that you could have a rule that says you need a buffer strip. But quite frankly, if you don't install, as it's shown in there, if you don't install it properly, um, don't get it right, don't don't get the buy-in, then you could have, quite frankly, a five-metre strip of grass that does very little. Um, and so I guess the point I really want to make and emphasise is the industry-led development of codes of practice and implementation um, um, is key to is key to getting these things right. Uh, just again, a same, same, same story, uh, protecting, protecting swales. In some cases you simply can't have, um, um, you can't avoid water going across the uh, overland flow, going across the paddock. So how do you go from, you'll see the situation there in 2016 and then the same paddock. Um, after years of um, um, trial and error, getting, getting these um, uh, mitigations, um, mitigations right. So while I've, while I've emphasised the story around erosion and sediment control uh, and, and acknowledging that particularly in Canterbury that as a part of a risk assessment would be, would be reasonably low, but you know, you've, still got to, you've still got to get it right, uh, is the nutrient management uh, work that's happening, happening right now. So exactly the same, exactly the same thing uh, following the, the same process that I've just described for joining the, in joining the dots, going from problem recognition through to... Uh, 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 research and creating guidelines, and there's a there's a recently launched sustainable vegetable systems project, um, seven and a half million dollar project for which I've been tasked as a program program manager for that, and the name absolutely encompasses the idea behind this this um, the, this piece of research. It's a sustainable vegetable systems. It's not a it's not a single crop nutrient management um, piece of research. It's 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 the system, it's the whole system, and again, without labouring too much about crop rotations and cover crops, it's how do you not just look at a single crop? How do you look at how that crop interacts with, with the crop before it and the crop and the crop after it? Uh, and this piece of work is underpinned by Plant Food Research doing detailed uh, uh, in-field uh, measurements in Canterbury and in Hawkes Bay. Um, so doing. Four years of really, really detailed uh, uh, research around nitrogen application rates, uh, leaching, and um, um, and creating creating models uh, for um, for nutrient um, use in crops, and consequently, if you know the nutrient use in the crop and your application rate, then you can model what the uh, what the leaching rates will be. 
And yeah, this is this is this this is the the, the program itself. So it has it has four four work streams. I've touched on the the controlled field experiments, um, which plant food are conducting, equally uh, and 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 definitely extremely important for, for grower engagement is that work stream two, which is nine regional monitoring sites. So we're doing essentially almost the same thing as the researchers are doing, but on paddocks around the country, of which there are two monitoring sites in Canterbury um, and the rest, around, the rest around the country. They all, all that data um, comes together in, in modelling. So we have, a, um, we have a team of people within Plant and Food doing the, doing the modelling, uh, very much very much starting off with with overseer uh, and and getting that right, but equally you need to be aware that modelling <coughs> isn't just overseer, which is like a long term long term average. So so modelling tools can equally be how do you um, how do you ensure that the practices are being um, 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 or, or new practices are being adopted. And so uh, you know we've touched on before. And, in the evidence around um, nutrient budgets. So there's a, Landwise, for example, has a, what I really love, like a one-page nutrient budget. You know, it's simple, it, take, it takes into account um, and, and the inputs and you get a number. <coughs> uh, and so this program is very much all about, uh, uh, is all about modeling both overseer and, and other on-farm tools. Uh, and finally, you'll see in Workstream 4, just the whole, you know, the whole uh, dissemination. How do you actually get this information out to the uh, um, out to the growers? And again, farm environment plans, linking back, reporting, um, uh, uh, benchmarking is is a component of that knowledge, um, knowledge uh, transfer. Which is my final slide. Uh, uh, what what you'll see there on the left hand side is around nutrient management practices. So you'll see on. On the left-hand side of that particular diagram, a list of various practices. So I've touched on before about having a toolbox of practices, uh, and that toolbox of practices is generally split into good and best management practices. Uh, and through benchmarking and reporting and collecting and collating information uh, through um, through the various GAP programs, um, certainly through the EMS NZ GAP program, you can start to get a picture. Uh, and tell some truth around um, um, around what's happening, uh, and you'll see there that there's um, these. This is how the growers have answered uh, questions about their current practices. Um, um, you'll see, you know, ranging through from soil testing uh, every three to five years, um, all of, all have ticked yes, through to those that are doing it annually, which is what around about 30%, uh, another 10% or so are, are partially doing that. So they're um, and they might be doing it on a few of their paddocks. And then a group of nodes, and and kind of what you'll what we'll see in time as I've kind of as, as I've kind of projected forward to, to 2025 and said how might that how might that graph look, um, and and it's just a way of showing of showing progress. You know, it's real, it's implementation, uh, and it's ultimately giving um, both council and and consumers assurance that things are that things are happening. And I guess my. My final point on that, um, just to preempt um, um, a question, is there's still there's still no's on that 2025, uh, and where we take a toolbox approach is you don't need to answer yes to everything. Uh, it could well be that you have a particular practice, which means that you don't need to do something else, um, uh, and 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 so that's just designed there to um, um, to emphasise that we aren't aiming um, to have. Uh, yes is ticked in every single uh, box or everything everything uh, Im implemented. Uh, and I think That's it. that Thank is you. the end of my... So, yes, again, any questions for Mr Barber? Can you no, no questions. Thank you. Can you yes, I just have a couple. Is a cover crop the same as a restorative crop? That's a very good question. I'm not really sure what a restorative crop is. Um, I suspect so. I suspect it. Is a restorative crop... <coughs> could you label a maize crop as a restorative crop? I imagine you possibly could. I'd definitely count um, it. I've got here, and I got this out of the um, Overseer Nutrient Modelling of Commercial Vegetable Production Report mm -hmm. uh, attached to Mr Ford's, I think, evidence. And it says maize... Mm 
-hmm. I think maize, plantain mm -hmm. and ryegrass mm -hmm. um, are restorative crops. Uh, lupins and oats and short-term ryegrass avoid leaching. Mm -hmm. They're winter crops. Um, but I don't quite know. I don't understand what a cover crop okay, is. Okay, okay, excellent. Good, because I can answer that one part better than I can the restorative, and I'm sure Mr Ford will answer the uh, thing on the restorative crop. Um, so a cover crop, for example, would be a mustard. So it's a crop that's grown just for the purposes of rotary hoeing it, getting it back into the ground. So creating some creating some biomass and then putting that biomass back into the ground, um, thereby increasing the organic matter in the soil. So typical cover crops will include mustard, um, will include um, um, barley, for example. So again, in the barley case, it's not been grown for the, for the barley as such, it's been grown for the organic matter, uh, and it'll be chopped and, uh, and incorporated. Look, we've, we've really, really encouraged the use of cover crops because, because the, the idea is that if you've got a period of time um, when the ground would otherwise be fallow, um, so, so say a three-month period, and obviously in a fallow period, it's the higher risk. If, you, if you're doing a risk assessment of what's the chances of leaching or um, 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 erosion, when that ground's fallow, that's the highest, that's the highest mm -hmm. risk. So the idea is you whack in a cover crop, um, and that's the organic matter. You get something growing, you get something above the ground, and then you incorporate it um, um, at the end of that, end I of that period. I think the restorative crop does improve the texture and fertility of soil. I think that's what I read. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so, very, yeah. so very similar then. What was now? Oh, this is about the code of practice for nutrient management. Mm -hmm. Are you the right person to ask a question? Try, try me. If I can't answer, I will. Would the Global Gap Accreditation System compel growers to take on BMP <laughs> more so than GMP? Okay. So good management practice versus versus best. Yes. Um, so to a certain extent, it depends on on where you are. Um, so my um, so my understanding is we've just been having the hearings. In horizons, and so some some areas there which are um, what's the term sensitive catchments need to go to um, need to go to best management practice. Right. Um, but yeah, but um, um, otherwise it, it's it, it's good management practice. Um, 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 equally, look, you you'll see in the farm environment plans and the example I had up before it had a and in fact actually on the slide at the moment all those practices. GMP and BMP, which is which is the nutrient one that um, um, that you're referring to, growers are still answering whether whether or not they're doing them, um, and 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 you'll see down there that quite a few of them are um, doing what is BMP, um, and it's also aspirational, you know, because I'm, 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 I'm aspirational and actually making people aware of what's um, 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 what's available. Um, so while we might say deep nitrogen tests are best management practice. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll be sitting here, no doubt, in a few years' time, and we'll just treat that as a good management practice. You know, mm. it, it'll become standard. Um, yeah. um, I'm pretty sure that we've got what GMP there is soil testing every three to five years. I suspect we'll be possibly laughing at that um, um, in a few years' time. Mm. Um, and annual testing, at least in the representative paddocks, will be just considered good management. Aspirational, they'll become, but GMPs eventually mm. become BMPs. Mm. Or the other way around. Thank you. I have no further <laughs> questions. So, Mr. Barber, you referred earlier to grilling. I hope you'll think of us as being <laughs> reading, listening, hearing, and understanding rather than grilling. <laughs> thank you very much for your Very good. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and just to pick up on the last point Mr Barber made about hori the Horizons um, plan change too. So what that's a little bit behind where uh, you guys are at, and Commissioner Van Voorhuizen will remember that um, plan and its first iteration. So that what that does is it distinguishes the requirement for BMP in areas which are highly sensitive, um, but GMP is appropriate where they're not. Um, but as mis it's a continuum, as Mr Barber mentioned, um, and that's the way that they've addressed it in that part of the country. Um, so while Mr Barber's le leaving, I'll bring Mr Ford's going to come forward now. Um, he's known to all of you because he has presented to you previously in relation to Canterbury plan changes. Um, 
I might get Mr Ford before he takes us through his summary just to perhaps pick up on the last conversation around restorative versus um, cover. Put you in it, but you heard the discussion, so I'm sure you can just clarify what, what in terms of the um, question from Commissioner Solomon. Good morning. Um, I understand you were questioning whether cover crops were restorative, and, and the answer is yes, definitely they are, because they're crops which nothing is taken away, so they're worked back into the ground, so it, it's restorative in terms of improving the carbon and, and, and the, um, the, the nature of the soil. So it's very much a restorative crop. So Mr Ford has done a statement of evidence, um, as like the rest of our witnesses. He's got just one slide that he's going to use to summarise the key points from that statement, um, and then obviously be here to answer any questions you may have of him. OK. Well, sorry. Yes, go ahead, please, Mr Ford. Thank you. So... I'm very supportive of the um, Section 32 report, which says that um, uh, the horticultural sector or CVP sector should be managed by a cap on the land area rather than managing it by the nutrient discharge levels um, produced by um, overseer particularly. And I've got quite a bit of um, content in my evidence around the problems we have with accurately modelling it's the CVP sector and, and overseer. So if, if we accept that that's the, um, the best approach, which we are with Plan Change 7, um, CVP then requires special rules to enable land rotation. But it's my contention that, and I think here we're talking about the volume of the cap, and, and so... As proposed, it's my impression that they were going to cap it at exactly the amount of area that was um, being grown in Canterbury um, now. And I, I think that growth should also be enabled. A and that's particularly because um, if, if we look at the different rotations, um, the, the root vegetable rotation can be grown across a large area of land, and that's the most dominant one, but the, um, the two vegetable rotations um, are a very small area and so no discernible impact on water quality from them. And I think we've got to that position because some of the early work that came out of Overseer gave us very frightening figures of, of nitrogen leaching from some of these crops. Um, as Overseer has improved its um, ability to model them and and probably partially because we're starting to not trust overseer in terms of the results. I, I think, and I, I've shown in my evidence, that in fact, depending on where you're growing in terms of the soil type or the climatic zone, um, the, <coughs> the, the end leaching from the total rotations aren't as horrendous as we thought they were um, you know, five or ten years ago when we were looking at individual crops rather than the total rotation. So, um, yeah, it's my contention that um, the area of land we're talking about is a, a very small area and it won't have an impact on water quality. Um, well, one of the other things was that um, there was a contention that there was the, the ability for um, people to offset... Um, land in terms of um, changing the existing use and taking up the amount of in that was leached under the existing use in, in terms of vegetable production. I, I think the problem is that um, particularly land use class one and two, which is the high value land, which is highly diverse in terms of the um, different capabilities of it, um, so demand for it is incredibly high and unfortunately in Canterbury supply of it is incredibly low. So you can understand that the value of it is very, very high. So if we look at the offsetting um, regimes that are available for us um, in terms of working out whether we can make them work or not, we can see that um, 
the, the only way it can work effectively is to um, lift the value of the produce that's produced off it quite considerably. Unfortunately, the CVP sector um, are price takers, not price setters. So if we were producing it at the values we required it for to, to do offsetting, um, people would just change their purchasing behaviour and buy substitute products. Um, and my last point is around um, following on from the previous two speakers about FEPs, um, our companies involved in auditing FEPs across Canterbury and quite extensively, and we are seeing very real improvements in terms of um, the, the metrics around the, the farmers um, adopting FEPs and then adopting the measures they've got to do to achieve an A or a B grade, and it's becoming quite a competitive um, activity. So I'm reasonably comfortable that FEPs will be able to manage the sort of water improvements we all want to achieve in Canterbury. Thank you, Mr Ford. So, any questions for Mr Ford? Good report, Mr. Ford. Thank you. Any Thank questions you. Mr. Ford, to Mr. Van Port, isn't it? No, no questions, Mr. Ford. But as usual, found your evidence very helpful, and in particular, um, appreciated your acknowledgement at your pair of fifty that overseer is still the only real way to model in loss. So, yes. and then at your pair of fifty-six, where you and you talked about this in your verbal presentation that you know considering crop rotations on a whole, the end loss is comparable to other land uses. So yes. Again, helpful information. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I just have one for Mr Ford at his paragraph 92 of your evidence in chief. Um, it's at the bottom, actually, of the paragraph. It's the last sentence. Um, with regard to water quantity, please describe what the difference is between the productive capacity of plants and enough water to keep them alive. OK. So <clears throat> plants consume water for two purposes. One's for to, to maintain their system um, and, and keep the, the, the system viable, and the other is to produce seeds or, or something which is taken away. So <laughs> what, what I'm talking about there is that... Um, what Hort NZ was proposing, that sufficient water was made available for the, the maintain, maintenance of the plant, not for the production of the plant. The production meaning to the, produce seeds? Produce seeds or fruits mainly. Right, because fruits. Because we're talking here about um, permanent crops mainly, so that would be um, mainly fruits. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. More. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're just, um, so we were up to, I just thought we'd just do a little recap. We've got our final, um, last but not least, important um, expert to present to you, which is Mr Hodson, who sort of brings together all the technical um, information and grower information, and we've attempted to bring it, as a group, bring it to you into a framework. Um, I'd just like to say at the outset, um, the framework is in general what we, need, we think we need. Obviously, absolutely um, open to any suggestions um, for improvement um, or any questions you may have about um, if you don't think it will work in the way we, we hope it will. So, um, Mr Hodgson and I have spent quite a bit of time just talking about um, some of those things just to make sure that it all does hang together because with the benefit of hindsight it's been a wee while since the evidence was presented. Um, and just to let, just remind you, I, we're tracking very well in terms of time. We do have that one grower, um, Peelview, that couldn't be here um, until two o'clock just in terms of where they've had to come from. Um, so hopefully, even if we finish a little bit early, um, that, that can be accommodated because they have travelled cool. some distance. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we certainly want to, to, to fit in with their needs. <coughs> thank you, sir. Thank you.
So the floor is Mr. Oh, Mr. Hodgson has both a statement of evidence, but also a rebuttal statement, and I've referenced that a few times um, this morning. Uh, the dated um, got the July statement, but also there's the uh, September uh, rebuttal statement. Yes. And and he's yes. also well, he's also got a presentation <coughs> like the other witnesses. Oh, well, we we read the original. We read the rebuttal <laughs> and now we're ready to have the summary with the slides. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioners, good, good afternoon. Good morning. I think we're still in. No, we're still in. No, we're in the afternoon. We're in the afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, the chairman might be still in the morning. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> I don't, I've, Never mind. It's 10 <laughs> <laughs> I've. Um, yeah, I've only got a couple of slides here um, because yeah, my role is to, to, to really mop everything up. And um, I guess before I do so, I just wanted to um, extend some acknowledgements to the two planners that um, that I also worked with with um, uh, with Rachel McClung, and um, that's uh, Olivia Cook from ECAN and Andrea Richardson. I'm not sure if Andrea is still involved in the process, but. Um, both planners worked really hard on uh, on the issue uh, the issue identification and in setting up the growers working groups and and working through um, you know trying to find solutions for uh, these issues for the commercial veggie growing sector that really only became <coughs> apparent through the implementation of um, of the land and water regional plan. Um, I've been in front of you before at the uh, Sao and Tiwahora hearings and the South Canterbury Coastal Streams. And this, this issue, particularly of the, um, the issue with lease block arrangements for the horticultural sector was just developing, I guess, in our own minds as we were working through those plan changes as, as well. Uh, and as I say, certainly when we got to implementation, um, we realised there was a real problem here. And, um, and we've all worked together to try and um, find some solutions there, and I'm hoping that my evidence has um, uh, assist the panel um, in their work as well to um, uh, to pull all the pull of, uh, the, this all together. Um, so yeah, I've, I think I've got three slides here. The first one was just a um, a sort of a recap of the national um, policy statement framework, and we were at there. Uh, Miss Atkins has really stolen my thunder uh, around this, but. Um, as we know, we've, we've had this sort of moving policy space, particularly at the, the national policy statement level and, and the development of the national environmental standards. Uh, and it's been quite tricky for the commercial veggie growing sector to navigate through uh, the changing package. But we now know where we sit. Um, and it actually leads to more work, as we know. And um, ECAM, we understand, have embarked on an exercise of review uh, across the, the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan uh, and across the Regional Policy Statement as well to see, uh, to ensure there is alignment uh, and that those planning documents, the higher order planning documents are giving effect now to the new uh, National Policy Statement Framework. Um, and I see Plan Change 7 um, certainly uh, contributes positively to um, the objective of the new MPS, Tamano to Wai, being expressed as objective one into the new national policy statement. Um, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a progression towards um, the water quality outcomes that um, uh, the higher order documents are all seeking. Um, and uh, in my opinion, is a, is, a, is a good framework and I've suggested some tweaks there, as I say, to try and um, uh, to, to pull it all together. And um, so I might just flick through to the next slide, if that's right, Rachel. So what I've done with my two slides was just to split up the sort of the, the I guess, the framework, the policy arm uh, of Plan Change 7 as it relates to commercial veg vegetable production, uh, and then the methods, the rules on the second slide. And I'll just talk through the, the sort of the key points, as it were, really, and then uh, we can get into some questions. Uh, so my first point was just there, certainly as, as a, I guess I've already outlined, um, supportive of the, of the framework um, to provide a bespoke um, framework around commercial vegetable production given it just wasn't working, uh, the consenting pathways weren't available as we thought they were uh, through the Canterbury Land and Water Plan and the sub-regional plans. Uh, Hort New Zealand has sought a new objective um, to be introduced into the Canterbury Land and Water Plan through their submission, but you would have seen from my evidence that I don't, I can't support that. I don't think it's necessary, um, and I've agreed with the officers on that point. But I have suggested that policy for 
uh, 0.36a uh, could be amended to better recognise the values of commercial vegetable production, uh, which I think are well uh, understood, well known, certainly regionally in Canterbury and nationally, and we're seeing those values, uh, I guess, be escalated in our higher order planning frameworks, and there's more to come around that as well, and certainly the, um, the review uh, of the planning documents relative to the new MPS are going to really reassess those values and, and the frameworks around that. Um, and uh, I guess also at a national level, we, we may well see the progression of the national policy statement for highly productive land as well, and that'll have a relationship with the values of commercial vegetable production. Uh, but I've suggested a, um, a change to um, policy 436A um, to recognise those values as well as the constraints uh, to commercial vegetable production. And um, yes, well, we can jump through to the through to the methods. Um, the, the, the first point I had up there was about amending that threshold for the permitted activity range under Rule 5.42 CA uh, from half a hectare to five hectares. And um, Commissioner Van Voorthuizen has raised the, the very valid point that um, that uh, the five hectare threshold really does align now with the um, the NES um, for uh, farming activities uh, and also the changes to the RMA around farm environment plans which are a requirement for horticultural activity uh, on properties greater than five hectares. Uh, and then we've got the evidence of um, Mr Tom Nation as well who's assessed the relative effects of moving that threshold from half a hectare to five hectares. Certainly my understanding is um, Growing activity under five hectares really isn't commercial vegetable production. Um, it's very niche and, and obviously the effects can be quantitated or have been quantitated by Tom. Uh, the second point I had up there was around um, the activity status for um, uh, consenting that capped area of existing commercial vegetable growing. Uh, it's my opinion that a restricted discretionary activity status is the right activity status rather than a controlled activity. Uh, which was proposed in the submission of Port New Zealand. Um, the RDA status to me is robust. Uh, there are good matters of discretion that are proposed uh, and I think that's the right way of going. My only um, uh, issue that, that I've raised and obviously the other submitters for Port New Zealand have raised is in regards to that baseline period of um, uh, using the, uh, the, the baseline as per the operative plan um, creates a number of issues for uh, existing growers. Um, there has been change in the co commercial veggie growing um, sector in Canterbury uh, and there's a real risk and effect um, if we don't recognise um, that change uh, in the rule structure. Uh, and again, the effects of, of, um, of moving that baseline date have been quantified by the horticultural uh, New Zealand witnesses there. Uh, the next point was in regards to that providing a pathway for growth, and as you would have seen from the evidence, uh, quantified at a, at, um, at 1,000 hectares, uh, and a restricted discretionary activity status, again, uh, proposed around that. Um, to me, that's a really useful way of, of again, recognising the value of uh, commercial veggie growing, that importance of, the, uh, of meeting the needs for domestic uh, food supply, uh, and again, providing a limit. Uh, and having confidence again in the restricted discretionary activity um, status and the assessment criteria that's there to deal with the effects of that activity. Again, those effects being quantified by, uh, by Tom Nation. Um, uh, the discretionary activity um, for new and expanded activity, I completely agree that's an appropriate threshold uh, and that those activities should be held to a, um, a loss rate, be it the nitrogen loss rate as specified or the the recommended um, GMP baseline um, loss rate that's been put forward by the officers where there isn't um, a legally established nitrogen loss rate already applying to that land. Uh, and the final point is obviously just in regard to that default activity status for, for the non-complying um, versus the prohibited activities. Uh, it's, it's certainly my opinion that um, that, that testing uh, non-compliance through a non-complying activity pathway is acceptable for commercial veggie growing. Um, 104D is going to be a difficult test for those proposals, um, be it an assessment against the objectives and policies um, or be uh, the effects-based test. It's going to be a, 
uh, a very complicated proposal to put forward in a resource consent application and a difficult pathway, um, but in my opinion, an appropriate um, pathway. And that's the end of my, um, my, my brief summary. So happy to move to questions. Thank you, Mr. Hodgson. Commissioner Van Voorhoosie. And I, th <clears throat> I think in the um, previous hearing, Salwan Waihora, I think I congratulated you on um, providing objective and helpful evidence. So I'll just extend the same thanks to you today. Thank you, sir. Do have some uh, questions for you, though. Um, and in terms, I'm just going straight to your appendix with the um, track change provisions. Yes, there now. Thanks, sir. Yep. So, just the first question: the baseline commercial vegetable growing area, um, the twenty, the fourteen to twenty nineteen. Is, is there any magic by twenty July? Is there any magic to twenty July? Uh, notification date from memory of plan change seven. Okay. And in terms of policy four thirty six A. And in terms of the horticulture New Zealand um, desire to make this extra 1,000 hectares of growth area available, do you think it would be useful to explicitly refer to that within 36A? Yes, Commissioner, I think that would be... Um, that would be worthwhile. That would certainly tighten the policy up. Um, so, so maybe don't try and mm. figure out where that yep. would go now, but no, just make a note if you could come back to us on that. Sure, yeah, no, no, I agree. I think... Um, that would just more directly lead into the rules at Hawke's Well, Zealand well it would, speaking. that's right, it's good because certainly um, the rest of the criteria and policies, 36A, do that, so that would make sense. That would close that loop. OK. And just similar um, uh, questions of clarification. So, and you've clarified... I think this for me in the PowerPoint. So 42, Rule 542CB, that's for existing operations within the capped area. Yes. Yep. And 542XX is for the 1,000 hectares of growth. Correct. Yep. Do you think it would be helpful if the chapeaus of those rules made that sort of crystal clear to readers of the plan? That I do. I think we'd, we'd sort of left that a little bit open with the in brackets provisional growth, struggling to find a, a yeah. term, but I, I, I do t think that could be tidied up, yes. Yeah, so having read through the information and having had the PowerPoint presentation, it's understandable now what those rules or your intention for them is. But yeah, if we can make the chapeaus crystal clear on that with some additional wording, I think that would help. Agreed. And I just noticed um, in Rule 542XX, um, Entry Condition 3, there's just... I think there's a gremlin crept into, crept into some of your wording. All landed is used for forms part of the commercial growing activity Apologies, operations. Yes. And just a little tidy up there. It should be the same as the previous rule. Yep. And a question um, for you, and but also for the 42A team because the question relates to um, text in red, which is not your text. But the 542CC, and I think also um, 436A, Clause B, it still refers to um, the baseline GMP loss rate. And I'm just wondering if that's potentially problematic because that derives from the farm portal. And I thought the whole intention of the provisions was to avoid having to use the portal for horticultural operations because it's problematic. So if that baseline GMP loss rate applies to a horticultural or vegetable growing operation, that would potentially be problematic. But if it refers instead to land that the horticultural or vegetable growing is to expand into, it might not be problematic. So I haven't quite got my head around that yet, but maybe yes. <laughs> you might have thought about that. 
and the 42A team might have thought about that. And if not, <coughs> if you could put your collective heads together and just yeah. let us know and reply, is, is this a problem or not? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think we, I, I might need to take some advice from Mr Ford around that, who's had the experience with using the portal. Yeah, and just if, if it applies to the vegetable growing operation or does it apply to the land that the vegetable growing operation yes. wishes to expand into, because depending which it is, would have a different answer as to whether or not it's a problem. And so you can see from my questions, I'm inviting you to, to give it some further thought to these provisions, which I did find helpful, but also to maybe confer further with um, ECAN staff that are going to report back to us in the reply. And if we can, you know, the more agreement we can get, the better. And, and when we heard from Potatoes New Zealand, I requested the um, staff to come back to us and reply with a solution to the problem that's been identified. And I just note in that regard, I think paragraph nine of Stuart Ford's evidence very nicely encapsulates the problem that you've put before us. Um, so yeah, very keen to see a solution to that problem uh, in reply. So if you can assist further in that regard, that would be helpful. Will do. Thank you, sir. But apart from that, no further questions, thank you. Thank you. Just on that, um, sir, we did discuss this as a team. We thought about whether we would present, you know, an, yet another amended version, but we didn't deliberately because we had listened to the ECAN presentation um, and we hoped that we'd be given the opportunity to get some feedback on our, on our wording with a view to refining it. Um, and just on Potatoes New Zealand, and I think... Just, I'm just going to put it out there, and Ms. McClung will kick me if I've got it wrong, but it'd probably be useful to have a conversation with them too, because we think the framework we've provided will work for them. Yes, definitely. Um, so we'll bring, we'll bring that conversation, because they've changed their position from what they put in their submission quite substantially, so it's time for us to have a conversation yep. with them, so that that might help <laughs> the reporting back team, the reply team, um, to at least understand the points of difference or not uh, yep. that exist. Yep. Yep, okay. that's right. I, I can't recall, but I may have asked Potatoes New Zealand to talk to Hort New Zealand as you, well. I think you might have. Um, and given the consultant that they're currently using, that's probably going to be quite easy to I, I would have thought so. It, it, look, to be fair, in relation to Potatoes New Zealand, at first blush, when you just read their submission alongside our submission, and we did, you know, liaise with them, um, we were not really singing from the same song sheet. Um, which would have made it made our job and your job a little difficult, but they have moved on in their thinking. Um, they've moved away from the idea that they must have a permitted activity regime. Their their focus is entirely on ensuring that rotations are appropriately yep. provided for. So that's been our focus too. So we just need to have that conversation with them, and we wanted to wait till after this hearing to do that. Sure. So Appreciate thank you for that. That'll be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. But no, no further questions, thanks. Thank you. No, I have no questions, thank you. Thank you. With the 542XX, Mr. Hoffman, why does it need to be a restricted discretionary activity? Why wouldn't it just be a plain discretionary activity? That's a good question. So, I, in my opinion, um, the restricted discretionary activity status is appropriate because we can define those particular matters of discretion, and then we don't then need to open up um, wider assessment matters. I think there's some more certainty there for um, the applicant, but we can be certain that the restricted discretionary activity um, matters are also going to deliver the outcomes that we need. And to me, um, they're all really important, but one of the key ones for me is actually a matter of discretion four, which requires the applicant to demonstrate uh, how any nutrient loss reductions and nutrient targets re required by sections six to 15 of the plan will be achieved. Um, so for example, in Sal and TY Hora, the decision was that there is a 5% reduction in nutrient discharges for horticultural activities across the board. So um, the, the applicant under this restricted <laughs> discretionary activity status is required to put forward, uh, in my opinion, some quite um, detailed information about how they're meeting these, um, these outcomes. Well, I'm not sure that I've persuaded, but I'll think about what you're saying. Okay. Is that? Coming to the other one, coming to the other one, 
non-complying activities rather than prohibited. One of the difficulties that I haven't yet seen my way through about that is, is the usual problem that with non-complying activities today, this is there a risk that the regional council can't manage multiple consent applications for their cumulative effects. Mm. And you, 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 you're in this industry, you know exactly what I'm saying. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it's a major problem. Mm. Liberal. So how do you say, if you're going to make it a non-complying activity, how do you say a regional council is going to be able to manage the mm. of multiple applications? Certainly another good question, sir. Uh, from the evidence that that, um, that I've seen from Horticulture New Zealand, the, there's really little risk of sort of unfettered expansion of commercial veggie growing. Um, it's an industry that has its own challenges in terms of being able to access the resources it needs um, to be productive. Um, and there hasn't been wholesale growth of um, commercial veggie growing as we've, we've analysed these baseline um, periods. Uh, and um, around the consenting regime is obviously the, the, the monitoring, the required monitoring that sits at the regional council level. Uh, that's going to need to keep a, keep a handle on um, the number of consents, where they've been granted, and obviously the effects. Uh, and to me, that, that, that it fits to me that we have this activity status, this cascade that we've got here, uh, from restricted discretionary through the discretionary and into the non-complying, which all require, I think, quite a, um, a detailed assessment by the applicant and by the council, information that's going to be really important to uh, assist that ongoing monitoring uh, and compliance regime and, uh, and to be able to uh, enable the council to hopefully sit above you know, the, the cumulative effect issue. Well, I understand you saying it's not going to be a gold rush. And maybe you're right. Does there need to be some policy strengthening so that the, the 104 capital D mm. helps helps to to avoid a situation of uh, the gold rush? That's right. I think that. Um yeah, there's a couple of things there. There's certainly the strengthening of the policy that Mr Van Vorthausen suggested in terms of the 1,000 hectares. That puts a, puts a limit uh, around that potential growth, making it even harder for uh, a proposal not meeting that limit to navigate through uh, the plan. Uh, at the higher order, I think the objectives, the settled objectives and policies in the Canterbury Land and Water Plan and obviously the regional policy statement are, are pretty robust, pretty tight. Thank you very much, Mr. Hodgson. You're from your assistance and your attending today. That's, that's very good. I think we've reached the time for the Dunch adjournment, have we, Ms. Atkins? Yes, we have, sir. And we've got the Peel View um, Grower um, Group coming up in at two. Um, and just to close from what you were discussing with Mr. Hodgson, I think as part of the thinking we need to do, the homework we have, um, thinking on your last point, just looking carefully at the policy to ensure that it provides that safeguard that you are concerned about, because I totally understand um, what you're saying in terms of I'm um, thinking through how do we ensure that the um, gold rush or, or vegetable rush um, doesn't, isn't inadvertently uh, provided for. So um, we'll, we'll give that some thought as well, because I think there's scope to do that. So thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you for that yeah. indication.
Um, so yes, we're, 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 we're all done as far as um, we can be at the moment and we're just waiting on our last um, grower to, to come and present to you and that will be the close of our case. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we'll sit again at 2 o'clock. Thank you, sir. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll check that they're on their way. I'm sure they are, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.